I think we're live. TikTok, yeah. time to rock. Here with yeah. What do you mean, John McRae and Dr. Mike Lacona? Um, hopefully, you know these guys uh, by now. If not, you haven't been following my stuff very long. But we're down here recording what could be the most epic series on the resurrection in all of history. So far, we've recorded um, William Lane Craig and Mike Lacona. Um, next, which will be a couple weeks from now, we're going to record uh, Gary Habermas and Michael Brown. And uh, we're going to see we're going to see what happens. But the plan now is to have uh, 24 video series on my channel uh, going through different areas. And then John's planning on making something for his channel. So should be pretty dope. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nate2D2 is already asking, where's Lacona's yellow shirt? <laughs> <laughs> see? <laughs> I knew it. Where is your yellow shirt, Mike? Um, well, Debbie has one. Hmm? Debbie has a yellow shirt. <laughs> you, 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 your, wife, your wife is going to put on her, your yellow I, shirt? I, I was just thinking with the yellow shirt you guys have on, do they make them for men? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's see. Laura S. K. Psalms 25. Welcome to Boom Squad Advance. Yeah. Hey, nice. Christian Wass says, hello, Hater Wood. Why do people call me Hater Wood? <laughs> All I do is help and encourage people. Uh, Tatiana J. said, I love Michael Brown. Yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. See, my normal inclination when talking about the, the resurrection is just to focus on the historical evidence. But I was really thinking, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to do one series that kind of addresses all the connected issues. So, so not just the historical evidence for Jesus' death, but, um, you know, defending the the idea that, that Jesus' death was a, an atonement for us. And so I uh, had Dr. Craig talking on uh, on that. Uh, but also with, with Michael, uh, M Michael Brown, I wanted him to talk about Old Testament prophecies about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. So yeah, trying to get trying to get all all the main issues into one, and that would kind of just leave um, a series on the deity of Christ as uh, as something to work on maybe later this year. And then you've got all the and then I would have all the basics of the gospel there. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> All right. So anyway, the, the plan here is just for us to uh, take questions from the chat for a little while um, or comments. Anything you guys want to talk about where uh, we are. Uh, we had to. Gosh, what time do we wake up? Well, we were out of here at 745, right? This morning. We had, we had Yeah, we had to we had to leave. Um, we had to leave at 745 to get to the church to set up and stuff. And then we uh, took us a while to get everything set up and then recorded a bunch of a bunch of a. Uh, clips of Mike and stuff like that. And so, yep, pretty, uh, pretty beat. So we're just going to uh, chill here with you guys. Yeah. See how things are going. Um, punch bowl haircut said, Hey David, what's it like being able to defeat any argument with one punch? She wouldn't know. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they're talking about? No, you're like a thousand years old. You don't know. Um, <laughs> there's a character that that's, that's my, my little, uh, this little guy. What is this called? Is this called an avatar? What's that called? Yeah. Something is that like what that. it called? Yeah. That's a character named Saitama, whose uh, whose power is he can destroy any enemy any enemy with one punch. And so my son Luke one day was saying, uh, "Hey, you want to watch a show with me? It's about a guy who can destroy any enemy with one punch." And I was like, "That's going to be boring, right? It's going to be boring." But that that's kind of the point of it. He he he's, the, the the show starts out with him walking around going, "I have no feeling anymore because I can't find an enemy to you know that can face me and stuff like that." Anyway, pretty <laughs> hilarious show. But uh, I like that idea of being able to destroy any any opponent with one punch. So. Kind of rolled with that. Um, All right. Got uh, there's one question. Um, it's from Adam Snow. It says, why doesn't the Holy Spirit know the hour if he is God? Matthew 24, 35 says only the Father knows. Now, caref careful because Adam Snow is a professional troll here. Oh, so, okay. gotcha. So, Adam, we're going to go ahead and answer a question. And then, just to make sure you're not trolling, you're going to have to answer some questions of ours. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right. Now, uh, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Doesn't the spirit know the thoughts of God? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, but it's Jesus. When, when well, no, Jesus no, no, no. He's knowing. asking about the spirit. He's asking about the spirit. Yeah. So how do we know the Holy Spirit doesn't know? Well, he's saying the because, because, only, because, only it says, because it says, yeah, only only yeah. the Father. Um, not uh, so. Adam isn't uh, apparently thinking that the, the Holy Spirit's in a in a different category when he says when he says no one knows and he's talking about all human beings and then not the angels. 
and then nor the son in that physical form, no. um, but only the father. But you also you also have that the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. So he's clearly not talking about the Holy Spirit yeah. there. Is that would that be? Yeah, I would, would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Adam Snell, now we've answered one of your questions. And so, to be fair, you should answer one of ours. Why does your God, Allah, command us to judge by the gospel? In Surah 5, verse 47 of the Quran, he commands Christians to judge by the gospel. This is in the 7th century. So this is the gospel that has been preserved from the 1st century down to the 7th century. We know what the gospel that Christians had during this time was. They treated the four gospels as a unit called the fourfold gospel. Just like in the Bible, if you refer to the gospel as a message, that could be a spoken message. But when you refer to it as a book from the second century onward, they refer to the, the four gospels as, if you're talking about a text, they refer to it as the gospel or the fourfold gospel. In Surah 5, verse 47 of the Quran, Allah commands the followers of the gospel, the people of the gospel, to judge by what he has revealed in the gospel. Why does he command us to do that? when the gospel completely contradicts the Quran on basic doctrines like Jesus' death and resurrection. And, and we will be awaiting that response, Adam Snow. So I'm keeping an eye on it, so uh, go ahead and let us know down below. Yo. Um, there's a question from Renee. I have a question, from, uh, question for Dr. Lacona. Why do you think some manuscripts don't contain John 8, the woman caught in adultery, and some don't? Or some do and some don't? Well, I guess the, the real question, uh, question would be is why do some contain it? Um, most New Testament scholars looking at the data, looking at the manuscripts, don't think that the pericope is of the woman caught in adultery was part of what John originally wrote. Um, in fact, I have a friend, John David Punch. He's a pastor right now um, up in Michigan and uh, Holland, Michigan, and he did his doctoral dissertation. He is conservative and he went into it trying to prove that the pericope of the woman caught in adultery was part of the original gospel of john and as much as he wanted to have that conclusion he concluded that it was inconclusive so he's he still has a little more conservative view than most scholars do on it and admittedly he studied this a lot more than most scholars have as well but he says in his opinion it's inconclusive so how it got in there we don't know um, it could be an authentic story about Jesus, just not in the first Gospel of John. It's also, I would think, possible that it could be part of a second edition of John's Gospel, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, yeah, so, so no, notice, um, even, 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 according to, even according to John, Jesus did far more things than were in included in his original, uh, in his original Gospel. Um, so the, the claim, as far as I know, as you point out, it could be a true story. The claim is not, hey, this is a false story that someone made up. The claim is this doesn't look like it was originally here in the Gospel of John. And so that's right. I think ultimately, in terms of whether it's authentic, just has to remain in question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but that that just calls into question whether that was part of the original Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. Doesn't call into question the rest of John, of course. Mm -hmm. And, and really doesn't tremendously call into question the story. Um, if it wasn't part of the original, then we'd have to wonder about authorship and so on. But, I mean, uh, to say that it was not originally part of the, the Gospel of John does not mean that the story was, was made up. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, uh, we, have, we, have to, we have to be careful. We have to be careful about um, using it to prove. But uh, here's what's interesting. That's um, a good question she's asking, too. Yeah. Um, here, here's, here's what's interesting, because that story is... is uh, we would use that story um, to say, "Hey, you know, don't 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 execute someone for adultery, right?" And that 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 the New Testament is giving its its thumb down to its thumb down to executing someone for adultery. But uh, it's kind of interesting. You you have the same thing in the story of Joseph and Mary, where it says, "And Joseph, being a righteous man, did not want to expose her to public disgrace." Yeah. And so he, he, he resolved to, to kind of hush up the matter. And so that's just interesting saying he's a righteous man. So he doesn't want to have this have this teenage girl executed when he thinks she got pregnant out of, you know, through through, you know, through adultery or something like that. So you kind of have this the same idea of, hey, don't uh, don't ca don't carry out that, that that legal punishment there. So anyway, interesting stuff. But anyway, similar idea to um, 
to, uh, to what we find in, in John, some manuscripts. Cool. Uh, liger system and the super sticker. Um, is that because your favorite animal is a liger? You guys know what a liger is? Tiger, lion, lion, tiger. Yeah, you mix them together. You, yeah. he, he's in, he's, uh, he, he loves all these uh, weird animals. <laughs> it's because my boy, my little boy loves animals. So we watch animals every night. We actually just watched some of the ligers the other night, like last week. It was dope. I think that's, I think that's Napoleon Dynamite's uh, favorite animal. He said a liger is his favorite animal. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thanks to Illaventier. Welcome to the Boom Squad. Welcome to the Boom Squad. The Boom Squad. The Boom Squad. Hey, hey, the Boom Squad. Um, yeah, uh, a couple of people are saying my time here conflicts with um, my time here. I mean, <laughs> conflicts with Christian princes. Yeah, uh, we, we, we probably should coordinate so we're not overlapping because we have a lot of a lot of the same people who watch us. Um, <clears throat> Austin Williams said, God is dead. There is only nations. What the heck are you talking about, dude? <laughs> <laughs> there is only nations. I have no idea what that means. Um, yeah, so you guys throw in your questions now because we're going to take, uh, you know, whichever ones you guys got here that we see that look interesting. I got one for Mike here. Cool. Chris Klaus said, question for Mike Lacona. Do you believe the Gospels are divinely inspired even though you view them as a Greco-Roman biography. Well, yeah, I do. Of course. Proclaim your heresies. <laughs> Acknowledge your heresies. Go ahead. Yeah, I do believe they're divinely inspired. Um, the fact that if, if they if they belong to the genre of Greco-Roman biography has nothing to say one way or the other whether they're divinely inspired. Proverbs was a common genre. In fact, the Book of Proverbs takes a number of its proverbs from Egyptian proverbs. It's still divinely inspired, I believe. So the fact that it's Greco-Roman biography should not at all do anything to call into question whether it's divinely inspired. And the idea is if God were going to inspire a text and people were going to be moved by the Spirit, but they're still sitting down to write text, they're going to use the, you know, the genre of the time, right? Of course. I mean, that's what we find. Acts is historiography. It's, it's a history. Paul used letters. If you were going to communicate to uh, another individual and write and make certain requests or answer certain questions, what genre would you use? You'd use a, a letter, an epistle. Um, so if, if you're going to write a history of the first three decades of the church or, you know, about a war or whatever, you're going to do history. Mm -hmm. um, Psalms are songs. So if you want to write lyrics to songs, what are you going to do? You're going to use this genre of songs. If you are desiring to write a book about the life of an individual, what genre are you going to use? Biography. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Mm -hmm. So you, mm -hmm. God, in whatever the divine inspiration process looked like, um, and I do believe the Gospels are divinely inspired, um, I believe the whole Bible is divinely inspired, but God uses humans to do it, and he uses various genres to do it. And I think it's just naive to say that the Gospels are of a unique genre, something that most scholars, it came up, skeptical scholars started that over 100 years ago. Before that, most scholars believed that the Gospels were ancient biographies. Um, and then skeptics said, no, they're a sui generis, a unique genre all of their own. But why? Why would you say that just of the Gospels, but of but not recognize while recognizing the genre of every other type of literature we've got in the Bible, and then just say, well, the Gospels are different in that way. No, they're biographies. Now, you might dispute whether they're Greco-Roman biographies, but Jewish biographies, we really don't have too many examples of them from the period. You've got Philo's Life of Moses, which is most agree it is a biography, but it's it's kind of a commentary on um, the life of Moses as presented in Scripture, you know. And then you've got Josephus's autobiography. That's it when it comes to Jewish biographies of that period. Everything else is the Greco-Roman, but even the Jewish biographies have a, a number of the literary devices that we find in Greco-Roman biography. So. I mean, if you're, and it is disputed, like with Luke, someone like Ben Witherington, an evangelical New Testament scholar, thinks that Luke is history. It's a, his, it's historiography. I don't agree with that. I do think it's biography. Um, and, you know, we could talk about that if you want, but 
you know, you can dispute some things like that, but there is certainly a biographical nature of these because they talk about the life of an individual. What other kind of genre would it be? Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> shout out to Corinth Chandler. Welcome to the Boom Squad. Son. Boom Squad. The Boom Squad. The Boom Squad. Hey, the Boom Squad. I just invented that song. All right. So why don't you guys tell me, what is the Boom Squad? What? What is the Boom Squad? You're not down with the Boom Squad, man? I don't know, man. Oh, now, <laughs> see, now uh, uh, YouTube channels can have channel members, and these are people who like, uh, join your channel to support and stuff like that. Um, we already had Patreon accounts and stuff like that, so people could, people could support us there. But uh, th- there's something that came up as a, as a bit of a concern. YouTube had banned certain people while acknowledging that the people hadn't hadn't violated any rules, right? They said Tommy Robinson hadn't violated any rules, but we're, we're closing off access to his uh, accounts. And then they, uh, they gave me a, uh, a hate speech strike just for mentioning Tommy Robinson. So that's scary to me, right? I was basically saying they shouldn't have, uh, they shouldn't have arrested this guy for reporting, on it, reporting a story, right? So the idea that, that they could just start shutting people down, and then they're doing, they're, anyway, the, the channels are doing stuff like this. Then YouTube uh, a few months ago came out with its new um, with its new uh, terms of service, and they say in the terms of service we as, reserve as of January first. Um, I think it was before that. Okay, um, it might have went into effect then. Uh, it might have okay. went into effect then, but they they posted it a little earlier. Uh, but they posted their new terms of service, and so uh, and in the new terms of service, and this is what was creeping everyone out. It says we re- we reserve the right to terminate any non profitable account at any time. And so they're saying, hey, any account that is not making money for us, we reserve the right to terminate. And we're thinking, why in the name of common sense? I mean, most they're not making money for most accounts. Why would, why would, and they're, they, you know, they, why would, why would they, they put that in there? And all I could, the only thing anyone has, has been able to come up with is they're basically com- coming up with a, a justification for banning, for banning more channels, right? For just saying, hey, we're banning you. And then because they're officially supposed to be a platform, they're not supposed to be a publisher. So they're supposed to be relatively content and politically neutral. They're clearly not. Mm-hmm. And so, but they still want to keep banning certain content. And so how are they going to justify that? Well, it seems like they're trying to put another justification in there to just say, um, well, you know, we, we said in our terms of service, we can ban you at any time. So you have no, you have no, you have no legal grounds to complain. So anyway, the, anyway, long story short, we couldn't come up with any reason for them posting that other than that they were looking for another justification for banning people without getting uh without getting sued over it and so the solution to that was making sure our channels are profitable and so instead of just patreon we have channel members and stuff like that and so okay. so now they can't use that our channels are making money because they take a cut of of the stuff here so anyway that, that's just that, that's just a theory but cool yeah and you guys named it the boom squad i named mine the boom that's squad well actually team. Uh, who, who named that team. I, it, I think the it was meme team, meme team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah he's got the meme team his his rhymes <laughs> uh, I think Vocab told me to bo- do Boom Squad. Yeah, I did. Um, all right, here's a good one for Mike Lacona. Um, for people who are here first time, we may not have uh, given a proper introduction here. So, Mike, um, as you're answering this, why don't you tell everyone your uh, background here? Yep. Just just your your, your scholarly background. Oh, well, I've had, I have a PhD in New Testament studies from the University of Pretoria, uh, which I earned with distinction. I uh, published my uh, dissertation with IVP Academic. I uh, have since published another academic volume, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? What We Can Learn from Ancient Biography, that was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. Um, yeah. Between those two books, I've also published a number of, um, of, uh, of academic journal articles and peer-reviewed journals. So, But as a result of the two academic books, the one with IDP and the one with Oxford. Um, I was nominated and was voted for membership into the Society of New Testament Studies. I mean, that's in, it's actually called Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas. It's the most elite organization in the world uh, to which New Testament scholars can belong. And you can't be not you can't apply for it. Um, you have to be nominated by two people voted with unanimous acceptance. There's about 800 members in it. So it's a great honor to be part of that. Um, I'm an associate professor of theology at Houston Baptist University. 
And so it's a little about my academic credentials. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and before we go on, just uh, 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 John, oh, yeah. tell us about what you do. Yeah, and then so Mike's going to get my, to the stuff uh, question. I got my PhD in memes. Um, <laughs> yeah, Memeology. Memeology. I'm going to be a memeologist. <laughs> no, um, so I run the channel called What Do You Meme? Uh, if you don't know. So uh, basically, I respond to anti Christian slogans, um, breezy slogans, memes, and videos. And um, I also do a lot of uh, commentary on culture issues and light of the gospel and what we can learn from it. So that's it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Mike, back to you. This question is for you. How do you guys respond to the claim that I've heard that Jesus is a copy of the Egyptian god of the dead, Osiris? So, yeah, he's heard this. Yeah. You've heard that too, right? Oh, yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. The question is, is this a good argument? And, and no, notice, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is something, uh, uh, I, I made a video called Islam's 99-1 rule, right? And this is focusing on how uh, Islam uses this kind of rule where, a, and you can see you can see you can see the 99 one rule being used in the, the video I just posted with William Lane Craig, where he reacts to a uh, some video clips by a Muslim apologist who is saying just absolute nonsense. But the audience doesn't know. So the general rule is if you have 100 people in your audience and 99 of them are going to mindlessly accept what you say without looking it up and only one of them, only one of them is actually going to bother to look it up and check it out. Well, the 99 can shout down and silence silence the one. So Islam has sort of thrived and spread using that method. But I acknowledge in there that other, other people can use this too. And so what happens is, how many people study Egyptian mythology? Well, not a lot, right? How many study the historical Jesus? Not a lot, right? So what happens is this allows people to go around and sort of say anything they want. And they'll go, ah, Osiris, just like Jesus. Therefore, the Christians, the early Christians, they copied this story. And if people don't know about the historical mm -hmm. Jesus and don't know about any Egyptian mythology, what are they going to answer? And so fortunately, we have people who do study this stuff. What do you think, Mike? <laughs> well, uh, the story is that o o Osiris is um, he and his brother just don't get along. And so his brother gets real angry with him and kills him. And just to prevent him from coming back to life, he chops him up into 14 pieces and scatters those pieces throughout Egypt. Well, um, Osiris' wife. Isis, who also happens to be his sister, um, must have been from West Virginia. Um, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> Completely random attack. I pointed out, all I do is encourage other Christians, and they attack me. Anyway, so everyone, uh, everyone gang up on the cool guy. Right? Isis, uh, who is Osiris' uh, wife and a sister, she goes and she starts going throughout Egypt to find these pieces, and she's able to find 13 of the 14 pieces. Um, you may want to guess what piece she did not find. Was it the no-no spot? <laughs> <laughs> so she finds 13 of the 14 pieces. She brings him back to life in the netherworld, the underworld, where the dead are. So o o Osiris becomes god of the underworld. But here he is. It, it's not that you're resurrected, resurrected life, immortality, where you come back to life and um, and come back and see things on earth and then ascend to heaven where you're, you're God. No, you maintain a shadowy existence as uh, you don't even have all your parts and a shadowy existence of God of the dead. It's more of a zombification than it is a resurrection. So it is quite different than what we have for the resurrection of Jesus. Um, e even... What we have today is a, a number of people, specialist scholars who specialize in this. They will even say that the Christians did not borrow from, from this. And you're bound to found, find um, parallels in just about anything anyway. Yeah. You know, we're all aware of a plane that took off from, well, many of us are aware of a plane that took off from Massachusetts one morning. And after 10 o'clock, it flew into one of the tallest skyscrapers in the world in New York City between the 78th. 78th and 80th floors, killing everybody on board. Well, I'm referring to the <clears throat> B-25 that flew into the Empire State Building on July 28th, 1945. It actually happened. There are photographs of the aftermath. You can look them up. Um, it's the same exact floors that the 767 flew into the South Tower on 9-11. So someone could say, well, look at, I mean, this, this is just, it, there's too much of a coincidence here. Uh, and besides, 9-11 was just, 
it was a thousand years from now. They say 9-11 was just made up. It was a myth. Well, how do you know that? Well, look at all the clues involved. When you have an emergency, who do you call? 911. Well, what was the emergency? Well, the U.S. was going through its greatest economic um, uh, um, recession in its history at that point. And so that was symbolized by the collapse of the World Trade Center uh, buildings. Well, what about the plane that flew into the Pentagon? Well, that just was symbolic of the declining U.S. influence around the world. Well, what about the plane that crashed into Pennsylvania farm field? Well, that just shows that all of this impacted the average American. Um, you can come up with modern mythologizing all the time. You can find parallel details in just about anything. So you've got to show that there's a causal connection between these. Um, yeah, and causal also, connection, unless you can do that. Yeah, as, as, as far as we can tell, the, the early uh, Jewish believers of Jesus had nothing but contempt for pagan mythology, right? Um, so, I mean, yeah, look, it just, makes, it just makes no sense that, and, and, and I mean, gosh, these guys are going to their horrible, bloody deaths. If it's, hey, we really like that story <laughs> of Osiris getting dismembered and then being almost completely put back together, let's make up a almost. story about Jesus rising from the dead <laughs> yeah. and being the Lord of life and the Messiah. Yeah, yeah, and so, um, these these parallels too. The parallels that he's talking about, they just like they're completely like spurious. They're not like like really good parallels. You know, it's just kind of like the resurrection parallel he just said, right? And even with um, uh, Mithra uh, springs the life from a rock, and people call that like a resurrection story or whatnot too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's completely out of date with scholarship too. They say like in the last like hundred years, everybody said like, no, this is you know um, this this these parallels aren't really actual parallels. So. Um, you can read actually online the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You can read it online, and you can read like the story of Osiris and stuff like this to check out these these parallels and see if you how how big of parallels you think they are. So you know, there's a, a guy, a Swedish scholar, his name's T. N. D. Mettinger, and he wrote a book. I think it was two thousand three. That's one on dying, rising gods. Right? Yeah, it, the riddle of resurrection. Uh, it's titled, um, and it, it's probably the most, as far as I know, the most recent monograph on this. Now, Mettinger, in his introduction or his abstract, he says that it's, it's pretty much the consensus of scholarship. It is the consensus of scholarship today that the Christians did not borrow from pagan myths of dying and rising gods. Yeah. And he says um, it's also the consensus of scholarship today that there are no parallels within the ancient Near Eastern religions of dying and rising gods that predate Jesus. Yeah. Now, Mettinger in spite of saying this is what the consensus says, he takes issue with it. And he says that he thinks there are three exceptions, maybe as many as five. He's a very careful scholar and he doesn't go beyond, you know, what he thinks the evidence can bear. But he does say, and you look at it, the, he comes at the end, he does say that he could be wrong on these. And in the end he says, no, the Christians could not have borrowed from this because these are tied to the agricultural cycles Jesus' resurrection is not. All these others talk about fi fictional characters in the gray, unnamed, distant past, whereas the resurrection of Jesus um, happens within the lifetime of people who are going around claiming that he rose from the dead. So he says the riddle remains. Um, yep, hope that answers your question, Pitar. Um, shout out to Lion of Olympus in the Super Chat says, just supporting the channel. Um, over here, I'm looking on John's computer, Abu ba <laughs> this name cracks me up. No matter. Abu Bakr Al Puff Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've laughed at that like like ten different times <laughs> on the channel. You got it? No. There's Abu Bakr Al Baghdadi. He was the leader of ISIS, and so his his name is uh, Abu Bakr Al Puff Daddy. <laughs> Puff Daddy is a rapper. Um, <laughs> So Abu Bakr Al Puff Daddy says, uh, David Christian Prince did a remarkable defense against Farid who critiqued your video, Five Disgusting Things About Muhammad, will you yourself respond to Fareed? I haven't looked at Fareed's response yet, but just the fact that he is actually responding and trying to, uh, trying to interact with some of the, some of the information that, that people find horribly disturbing uh, means I will, um, I will almost certainly check out his video and respond. Actually, I, I mean, if he's responding to things like Muhammad being covered in semen, um, you know about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. if he's responding to things like Muhammad being covered in semen and Muhammad sucking on, you know, a little boy's tongue and 
That was uh, his co- or his nephew, apparently, according to Muhammad's friend. Yeah, I know that. That's, it's, it's <laughs> top five right. most disgusting facts about Muhammad. <laughs> Sucking on your nephews. <laughs> that makes it better, though, right? Wait, no, that's his grandson. <laughs> was it his grandson? Wait, my brain is really, really fried I today. Think he, I think it was his nephew, if I remember right. No, this is his grandson. Who he loved very much. That's what one of my Muslim friends said. Oh, well, no matter. What are you talking about? Hang on, hang on, hang on. You're old. No, no, no. I, I, really, I really am having trouble thinking here. That, I know. That's what happens when you get old. No, that, that's his grandson. That's, I think that's his grandson in, in, okay. in that thing. Yeah, but no, no, no. That's the point. The point is, <laughs> well, you this guy. That my friend said, well, David didn't right. mention right. that it was his grandson who he loved very much. That's what he said. <laughs> he said, oh, that makes it better, right? <laughs> it's Makes it more weird, almost, because then it's incestual. Yeah, it's it's that it's 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 that it's it's not even that it's sexual; it's that it's disgusting, it's incestual. right? Incestual. Yeah, it's yeah, but the, no, the, yeah. The point is, it's not; it's disgusting. Right? Oh, Here's a guy who's covered in semen who would have sex with all nine of his wives in one night and take one bath and things like that. He's doing all this stuff. He's climbing on top of all these different girls. Uh, he's he's having sex with his slave girls. Who who knows what kind of uh, diseases he had. And then he's, hey, come here, little little boy. Let me suck on your tongue. <laughs> maybe that story. That's is, disgusting. That's just that, disgusting. Maybe that story was told tongue in cheek. <laughs> this is what we have to do. This is what we have to deal with with, uh, with Mike. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so yes. Uh, so yes. I'd like to. Matter of fact, I'm gonna tell you what. That what one, one of the one of the things that, that that bothers me over the years is that so few Muslim I mean M- Muslim apologists generally want to stay on the offensive and not actually deal with these issues. If Farid's actually willing to discuss them, I will probably invite him on, invite him on live to actually discuss this. We'll pull up the sources and he can give us his interpretation, uh, and I and I'd be fine with that, right? Yep. I would know. <laughs> John Buckley said, "David, what's your opinion of chick tracks? You guys know about these chick tracks? Oh yeah, uh, long time ago. Are they still around? I don't know. I think Jack Chick died." Um, but I, I'm guessing they're still around. You know Chick Tracks? No, I have no idea what that is. There were these little comic books. Some of them were like some of the most amazing artwork ever. Some of them are just, you know, cheesy little, you know, cartoon comics and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. they were they were tracks. There were these little comic books. And some of them you're like, gosh, what amazing artwork and stuff in here. Uh, yeah, the, the opinion on the Chick Tracks is I thought I thought some of them were, were awesome. And I thought I thought mm-hmm. others were, were really, you know, cheesy garbage. Um, right. So that was my that was my thoughts on that. Uh, matter of fact, I was in prison when I got a copy of Allah Has No Son. Which that track ends with uh, a picture of Muhammad burning in hell and bowing down and saying, Jesus is Lord. And I was like, whoa, this guy put this in a little comic. <laughs> um, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, when some. <laughs> it's kind of a long story, but I was locked up. I was at uh, Stanton Correctional Center and some. Muslims went and complained to the administration uh, about me that I was hurting their feelings on Islam. So the fact that they, these were like younger Muslims and guess what? You don't go complain to the administration. Those of you who know how prison works, you don't go and complain to the administration. That's, 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 that makes you a snitch, right? And what was funny was even the older Muslims, the older convict Muslims, they agreed with me. They're like, you're darn right. You shouldn't go. You shouldn't be complaining to the administration. Yeah, if you want to you want to beat his face in or something like that, that's fine. But, uh, you know, you don't go complaining. So anyway, so uh, so I, I, I told them, uh, you know, I, I called them out for being snitches and stuff. But uh, I had a chick track and I was uh, and the the imam there who was who was a young guy i said uh i I told one of my friends who was in who was in his dorm i said uh go give this to him and tell him it's from david wood i wasn't gonna hand these out but since you guys are messing around now uh yeah i'm gonna (laughs) have to do it what's funny what's funny is that's kind of that's kind of how i've been ever since it's just guys hey you want to be nice i'm happy to be nice if if you're gonna send me death threats and threaten to rape my wife i don't expect me to be nice about your prophet who encourages you to act like this and then they send me death threats and say they're going to kill me and kill my kill my family and rape my wife and kill my kids and all this nasty stuff. And then so I said, OK, well, I'm not going to be nice about your prophet. And they go, oh, we can't believe you're you're being so mean to our prophet when all we do is is gently encourage you to to believe in Islam. Wow. No, notice, notice that that's like my first impression of Islam was that these guys are going around harassing people. And the first guy who actually stands up and says, "Hey, let's uh, let, let's uh, let's have some discussions on this," and, and I, I think I, I don't think this guy's a real prophet. They go and complain to the administration about it, right? Notice you got that same sort of thing, right? In areas where 
where Islam can just take over and dominate. That's what it does. In, in areas where it's a small minority of the population, it's all, oh, we're victims, we're being oppressed. <laughs> Interesting stuff. What a religion here. Um, all right, here we go. Sam Shamu would be a good one to, uh, to talk about this. But is Jesus the son of the Most High God, or is he Most High God? I would say it's going to depend on what you mean by Most High God. You could specifically re be referring to God the Father with that. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, the, the one triune God, then Jesus would be um, both. He would be son because that's his position in the Trinity. And so he would be God, um, but he would also be the son of God as the son of the Father within the Trinity. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that when a man and woman marry, the two become one flesh. So what does that mean? I mean, obviously, they're not sewn together at the hip, right? I think it means that they become one unit. Um, and so I think in the, when you talk about God, the Christian view is that it's one God. Think of God as a unit. One God is manifested in three distinct persons. So in answer to this question, if we look at it that way, Jesus is the Most High God, and he's the Son of the Most High God. If we look at, at Most High as the Father, he's the Son of the Father, but all of them make up the unit we would call God. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, we, we will have, uh, we'll be doing more on the deed of Christ. As, as, as I pointed out, uh, i got a series coming out on the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, but we'll want to do a ton of, of videos on the deity of Christ and actually breaking down. But I mean, if you, if you, I mean, if, if, if you think about that, um, here's what, here's what's awesome. I mean, in, in the, in the opening chapters of Genesis, we're told that God created man and woman in his, I mean, uh, he, he created man in his image, but male and female, he created them. Um, so notice Eve was man, but the Hebrew there is Adam, right? So Adam, so no, notice here, right? Adam is a name but it's also kind of a, 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 a nature, a thing that you are, right? So Adam could be a name. So Adam's name was Adam, but Adam was man, which the, the word is Adam. So Adam was Adam. Eve was Adam. Eve is distinct from Adam, and yet they're both Adam, but one is named Adam. So it's just, it, it's just interesting that... Uh, Male and female are created in the image of God, and you start seeing you start seeing this kind of this kind of relationship. I, just to be clear, this is you have to be careful with analogies of God because at the end of the day, there's nothing that's actually like God. Um, all we can do is kind of understand how something can be one in one way and more than one um, in a different way. But um, normally, when conversations like this start out, people say, you know, what, what what was Jesus? Was he God or the Son of God? You know, I usually say, well, what are you, man or the Son of Man? And the answer is you're, you're, you're both. And so you have, to, you have to start thinking about what you mean by these, by these terms. You can be a son of man in one way, and you can be a man in, in, in a different way, right? Um, and so when you're talking about God or the Son of God, you got to look at that in the light of, of Christian theology. Um, by the way, um, just if I can plug a video, a lecture I did on did Jesus think he was divine? Did Jesus think he was God? You plug all you um, want. What's it, what's it called? I think it's, did Jesus think he was God or did Jesus think he's divine? It's on my YouTube channel. And I've got a lecture on that where I argue historically, for historical reasons, that Jesus did think of himself as divine. And he has a long chapter on that in this book, right? When you talk about, well, you talk about like the, um, who, it's something about who did Jesus think he was. There's a long section on that in this book, right? If I remember right. Uh, I don't think so. I thought you did. Maybe not. Okay. This lecture, this lecture Jesus claimed to be did God. Jesus claim to be God? Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to pull this up here. I swear I thought you did some post this in, but maybe I'll, I'm misremembering. Yeah, anyways, this book is still awesome, by the way, guys. <laughs> I recommend this book all the time because this yes. was a, a good book. I mean, it, don't let it intimidate you by how big it looks. <laughs> it is big, <clears> but there's <throat> a lot of footnotes in here, too. So just so you guys know. Yeah, a little over 2,000. Which I love because I hate the end notes. Oh, I hate end notes too. Yeah, it seems yeah. like everybody hates end notes, but the publisher still. <laughs> yeah. it, so I don't, you know, I don't get it. Listen to the people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> people don't like end notes. I know. So, but the book is awesome because it, it will give you a good, um, and he tries to be as objective as he can in the whole book and tries to give a good um, synopsis and understanding of all the different um, things that relate to 
um, the historical Jesus and the resurrection in the, the first century. Right? Is it, is it just first, first, second century? Yeah, because you got Josephus in there and some other stuff. But, but yeah, yeah, mainly first century, but yeah. early second century. Yeah. All right, here you go. Uh, what is that? Pause. Pause. You did that on purpose? Yeah. Okay, just, make, just making sure we weren't actually paused yeah, or something like that. Pause up here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here's a question for you, Mike. Muhammad Hussein, so it sounds like a Muslim. Uh, how many wi- how many women visited the tomb? According to Matthew, two Marys. Mm-hmm. According to Mark, two Mark, two Marys and Salome. According to Luke, a group of women. And according to John, Mary Magdalene. Clear Ooh. gospel contradiction. These depart. guys, resurrection destroyed. Um, I have to point. I, I I'll point out something after after Mike goes. But go ahead. Well, um, I think what's going on here is a compositional device we might refer to as literary spotlighting. Now, I found this very, very common throughout Plutarch's lives that that he does this. And we do it in our everyday conversations as well. It's just part of ordinary communication. So think of you go to a theatrical performance and you see a number of actors on stage and then the lights go out and a spotlight shines on a single actor. Now, you know that there are other actors on, on stage, but the spotlight is focusing on that one, so that's the only one you see. Literary spotlighting is when an author knows that there are various people who are involved in performing an act, but only mentions one because that's the only one that is of biogra- biographical relevance or historical relevance at that point. So... Um, I think that this is what's going on in the resurrection narratives and the number of of women who go to the tomb isn't the only time it's being used there. I think there's four cases of it within the resurrection narratives. So, for example, um, you know, Mary Magdalene, I think, is the is the main woman who's going. And I think it is telling that uh, in John chapter 20, verse one, it says early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and found it empty. And she ran back to Peter and the beloved disciple and said, they have taken the Lord and we don't know where they laid him. Well, who's we? So that's one. And then John says that Peter and the beloved disciple got up and ran to the tomb and found it empty. Uh, Luke says that Peter got up and ran it and to the tomb and found it empty. Well, is it Peter and the beloved disciple or is it just Peter? Luke doesn't say it's just Peter. And 12 verses later, you have Jesus talking to the Emmaus disciples and it says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And so they're telling Jesus what happened and they say, you know, we thought he was the Messiah, but he was crucified. And then this morning, uh, our women folk went to the tomb and saw angels said jesus had been raised and then some of our own some of our own went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said well but luke just 12 verses later you said it was just peter no he didn't say just peter but peter was the lead disciple at that point and so he just mentions peter so you 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 have that going on and by the way when they went to the tomb matthew and mark report that there was one angel and Luke and John narrate two angels. So what's going on there? Well, it's probably literary spotlighting again in that Mark followed by Matthew is shining their spotlight on the angel who's doing the announcing. Yeah. So I think you've got these four instances that are going on just in the resurrection narratives of literary spotlight. Yeah, it's a contradiction. So I was just trying to say it's a contradiction. It would be a contradiction if it said there was only... So it's like if I say, I'm here with David Wood, right? And then later I say, yeah, I was sitting down with Mike and David. And, you know, another time I was like, yeah, we were all doing something right. Yeah. Or or, or, or imagine if you guys were explaining what you're watching right now. And you said uh, one of you went and said, uh, you know, someone said, what were you doing? You said I was watching David Wood. Yeah. And then another one said uh, I was watching David Wood and and John McRae. Another one said I was watching David Wood and Mike Lacona. Another one said I was watching David Wood and Mike Lacona and John McRae. It wouldn't be a contradiction, right? It'd be a contradiction if you said only David Wood, mm-hmm. you know, only David Wood was there. So the same kind of thing when you're looking at the Bible, too, when there's one or two. But a real quick question. Who is Aunt Meme? I see Aunt Meme comment in the comment, and I don't know you. You're not related to me. I'm just messing around. I don't know who that <laughs> is. That's dope, though. That would be funny if uh, you had a, uh, your, your, uh, you, you end up with, like, Aunt Meme and Uncle Meme and <laughs> Uncle. Meme Jr. and <laughs> Little Meme and stuff like that. <laughs> Little Meme, Big That'd Meme. Be cool. <laughs> hey, Tatiana said. Tatiana said, uh, "Boom Squad members are immune to the slow mode in the chat." Is that is that true, everyone? 
I did not know that. That's actually that's, uh, that's actually cool. Yeah, that is cool. No, what's slow mode? Slow mode is where um, uh, you can click on. I mean, you can you can you can set up YouTube to where people can only co uh, post comments like every sixty seconds, or you can make it every two minutes, or every thirty seconds. How you want to do it. If you don't set that, then basically people can make as many comments as they want as fast as they want. The problem is it becomes hard to read if people are people are posting. So I normally put a 60 second slow mode on there, oh, okay. which means someone can only post a comment every 60 seconds because otherwise I can't. I mean, I, I don't I don't come close to keeping up with them, even as even with the 60 seconds, uh, even with the 60 seconds. So hey. uh, I can't. The point is, I can't even I can't even see them fast enough if I don't have that on. So um, so what but, do you have to do to be a Boom Squad member? You just go to my channel and click on uh, click on join. And you'd want yeah. to do that because because this channel's awesome. Hey, um, you got, here's another debunking of the resurrection. Uh, it's from Muhammad Hussein says, according to John, there is no body found in tomb. According to Mark, they saw Jesus. In the tomb? <laughs> I, was, I was trying to understand his comment. I don't understand what it means. But he's saying, uh, that's what he said. So Muhammad Hussein, our Muslim friend here says, mm -hmm. according to John, there is no body found in tomb. According to Mark, they, they saw Jesus. Jesus. I think he's, he's mm -hmm. never read. Probably no. He's lo he's looking up a web. He's going to a website and copying and pasting stuff without ever bothering to actually read the sources. <laughs> um, shocker! 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 All, all four gospels report that the tomb was empty of Jesus' body. Right now, the only kind of, uh, of uh, difference that I, I could think in that sense, bodies in the tomb, is that John mentions and and Luke mentions. All right. So Mark, Luke, and John mention that. The angel or angels are inside the tomb, right? Um, but Matthew says that the angel rolled the stone out of the way and sat on it, meaning he would be outside the tomb. So you could say that the position of the angels when they saw it were was different, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. You know, you can have some things. I mean, maybe the angel actually went inside the tomb later on. Um, maybe it was the guards that reported that the uh, angel rolled the stone away and sat on it. I mean, how else would they know? Because the women weren't there. So that testimony could not have come from the women. And sometimes, you know, history is just a little more complex than, than, than we may imagine. Um, I think it was three, three years ago um, here in Georgia, there was some um, convicts that were being transported and somehow they overcame the two deputies killed them Whoa. and took their guns. And so they were loose for a while. I came, I was, I slept a little longer than my wife that morning. And when I came out, Debbie said to me, Hey, you'd be interested in the story um, because these two convicts that have been on the run, they went to steal a car and the guy saw it and he had a gun in his house. And he came out and he held him at gunpoint until the police came. I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, Mike's, second, a, Mike's a gun nut, just in case. Second Amendment, man, man, you know? <laughs> so, um, but then the news came on, the story came on just a couple minutes later, and it said, yeah, these guys were involved in a high-speed car chase with the police. They crashed the car, and the police got them. And hmm. I said to Debbie, what? That contradicts what you said. She said, now, hold on a second, just wait. And then they came back and they told the whole story. They'd been in a high-speed chase. The car crashed. They fled on foot through the woods. Mm. They came to the guy's house. They were trying to steal the car, and he came out and held him by gunpoint until the police got there. Mm. They so were, they so were those, those, those sounded like completely different stories mm. of what happened. That's and right. Yet, that, that's what happened. And we got to admit that mm. sometimes this is going on in, in accounts, and we don't realize it. And, you know, I'm hesitant. I'm very hesitant on sometimes to say, that there is definitely a contradiction, and I'm not. That's not just for the Gospels. That was for Plutarch and any ancient thing. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. I, I think we can say it's a good candidate for a contradiction at, at, on some occasions, but I don't know that we can say with certainty. You, you definitely don't want to do it with you know one here and two there and, and things like that. I mean, especially when, again, especially when you got Mary Magdalene and it just talks about her, but then she says we don't know where they've laid that's him, right. and it sounds like she's talking about a group. You should you should be looking at that, saying, "Hey, maybe I need to be careful here." Um, well, you got some of the dumbest comments I've ever read in my life. Oh yeah, want to yeah. go through some dumb comments? <laughs> yeah, if you want. Hi. Uh... Oh, hey. <laughs> I said I just read it. This is good. Hang on. Uh, uh, shout out to uh, Liger System for uh, joining 
The Boom Squad. The yeah. Boom Squad. The Boom Squad. Uh, hi, uh, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm not going to try. It says, you guys worship the cross. We worship the cross. Okay. Because Jesus dying at cross. So if Jesus dying at electric chair, you guys still worship electric chair. Ha, 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 ha. Um, John, have you ever worshipped a cross? I'm, yeah. I'm kind of shocked by that comment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you? <laughs> <laughs> good pun. No, it's not. It's yeah, not. That was good. It's just I, the way I'm wired. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, just so you know, back in the day when Mike and Nabil would hang out, because Nabil would do that too. It's really annoying. Everyone hates it. <laughs> Uh, just coming up with puns all the time. But then Mike and, and Nabil would get together and they would just go back and forth and see who would, you know, not not come up with a pun. I'll tell you who the person. best is Paul Copan. Is he? Really? Um, oh, he's unbelievable. Really? Notice, nobody, notice, nobody it's, it's, always, it's always nerds. It's always just total <laughs> nerds who are, who, are, who are coming up with the puns. It's a, it's a nerd humor thing. But notice that it's a psychopath who doesn't like that kind of humor. <laughs> yeah, so if you don't like puns, you're a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go with this. Uh, but okay, right. so here, you guys worship cross because Jesus dying at cross. Uh, how many of you guys have ever worshipped the cross? No, oh, everybody never. and all the Christians everywhere worship the cross. I'm not, never met a Christian who worshipped a cross. Uh, but if Jesus, Pena, so so if Jesus, but, oh go ahead. Oh oh oh, I was I was gonna say, no, but if you you know you could find you could find uh, you know certain people of traditions who would like bow down to a, a cross. Yeah. They're, they're focused on Jesus, but they would bow down to a cross. Yeah, it's not the if, cross. If you, if you think, if you think that's, if you think that's worshiping. Now I, I would, I would, I would certainly be, I would certainly be careful uh, about that. So I would not encourage people to, to bow down to, uh, to a cross. But my point is, if you think that's worshiping a cross, what do you do with every Muslim five <laughs> times a day, bowing down to the Kaaba? By your definition, that would be worshiping the Kaaba. So Muslims worship the Kaaba. And so you could say, ha ha, Muslims worship a cube. If it had been in a circle, they'd be worshiping a circle. Durr, right? <laughs> Come on. Um, no, sorry. Uh, we don't worship the cross. Never met a Christian. We worship the Almighty, the triune God of Scripture. Um, well, Liger's system upgraded to Boom Squad Advance. Oh, snap. Oh, then, he, then he upgraded to Boom Squad Ultra. Oh, snap. <laughs> no, no, Liger that? system, are you what's sure? What's the difference with those? Are you sure you're not? You, 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 get, you get different perks. Yeah. For, 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 the past, like, for the past like two months, I haven't, uh, I haven't been completely consistent on the perks because there were certain videos like, the, like uh, Muhammad's Boom Boom Room that I was going to give them advance notice, but I haven't even gotten to them because as anyone's been following my stuff, everyone in my family's dying left and right. Like, so anyway. Uh, Mike, you should join the Boom Squad, though. It'll be a blast. The heck is wrong with you guys? <laughs> no. Come on, guys. I'm about to cut this live stream. Swear, <laughs> just to cut you guys off. Um, yeah, but you you can have you can have you can, It's basically you know people can contribute different amounts and stuff, and they're, they're di you can have different perks. Uh, you know, so uh, like, to that. do you have to do that on a monthly basis, or do you do it once? Does that make you a permanent member of that level? No, you can. Um, you can no, you, you can you can change it at any time. But yeah, it's it's a it's a monthly sort of thing. So okay. once you realize yeah. David Wood is heretical, you can leave if you need, so that way you don't feel bad. <laughs> B.J. Richardson, welcome to Boom Squad Basic. The Boom yeah. Squad. The Boom Squad. <laughs> Yo, Brax, that's Brax. What the heck that's is wrong boy. with you? Yo, Trinity Brax. Radio says this episode is making me very cross. <laughs> there you have it. Hey, Braxton. <laughs> or maybe that's Jonathan. Or it's, it's probably Braxton. Braxton? Yeah. He's great. I love both of them, man. They're cool. Yeah. My dudes. All right, let's go through, uh, let's burn through uh, some comments here. John, find right. some. I got a couple I can respond to real quick. Cool. Uh, Fred Sampson oh, said, Hold on, we got a follow up to that last one. Says, oh, really? Okay, so if you saying you didn't worship cross, then if Jesus dying got an electric chair, then the cross at least have five electric chair, because I see every church has at least five crosses. All right, we're just yeah. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So, so let, 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 let me let's go through that again. <laughs> Haya says, okay, if you saying you didn't worship cross, then if Jesus dying at electric chair, then the crutch at least have five electric chair. Because I see every church at least they have five cross. So the the claim here, and by the by the way, uh, Hyatt, we know you didn't invent this. Uh, this is one of those uh, completely ridiculous and stupid. You're not going to give them that much credit. Yeah, uh, people say, oh, you know, you guys, you guys uh, have a cross. Um, let me break this down for you. Before before the spread of Christianity, the cross was a symbol of Roman power. When you saw one, you didn't think about salvation or anything else. You thought the Romans will put me on one of these if I get out of line. It's a symbol of Roman power. Do not mess with us or we will crush you, right? After the time of Jesus, 
After the time of Jesus, it becomes a symbol of God's power, God's power to use the bet, the worst, the worst that human beings can do to achieve the, the, the greatest things in the world. As far as why Christians would have a cross or something, you also have Jesus teaching things like we have to, we have to take up our cross daily. And so things like having a cross are reminders of that, that we have to take up our cross daily, Na namely that we are uh, to, to constantly be dying to our, to, our, to our own selves and our own fleshly desires and so on, and to focus on God. Now, the idea that you would have a problem, you would call that worshiping the cross, is so ridiculous that uh, I'm afraid I just can't take it seriously. Any, any other thoughts on that? I just want to say, I hope that we got our point across. <laughs> it's like getting worse and worse. You guys aren't getting better as you get into the meme. You nailed it, man. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, Fred Sanford here says, a Muslim friend told me that uh, Ahmadis are not Muslims. Do they take the same Shahada as the Sunni? Yes, they do take the same Shahada. They believe in all the five pillars. They believe in all the six articles of faith and so on. The real difference between uh, Ahmadis and uh, Orthodox Sunni Muslims is that Ahmadis have a different view of end times, right? So critics of the Ahmadis will say, ah, oh, you believe in a prophet who came after Muhammad. Well, guess what? All Muslims are supposed to believe in a prophet after Muhammad. They're supposed to believe in the return of Jesus. Ahmadis believe that already happened. And so their, their view is they, they, they disagree with uh, Sunni Muslims on the, on the, the time of the, of the return of Jesus. So Ahmadis believe it already happened and so on. Uh, so that's the, that's the main difference. And so, uh, yeah, if, if, if a person wants to say you're not a Muslim because of that, guess what? You could probably point to almost any Muslim and say, here's something you're, you're getting wrong in your understanding and therefore you're not, you're not a real Muslim. But uh, if you want a more thorough discussion of that, Fred Sanford, um, I have a video titled, Was Nabil Qureshi a Muslim? Or was Nabil Qureshi a real Muslim? Or something like that. And it's because people were pointing out that because Nabil was an Ahmadi, that he wasn't a real Muslim and so on. So I, I, I made a video going through the similarities and differences between Ahmadis and Sunnis. And I pointed out, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, don't they take the Shahada? Yeah, Muhammad said, if you recite the Shahada, you're a Muslim. So wait a minute, well, if they recite the same Shahada. Um, you have others that if you, if you keep the pillars, uh, the, the, the five pillars of Islam, then you're a Muslim. Well, guess what? The, the Ahmadis do that. And so you, in order to, I, I point out the only way you can get around this, the only way from the Muslim sources that you can get around this and say they're not real Muslims, is you would have to use something like Surah 4, verse 65, which says that if you find any resistance to anything Muhammad has said, you're not a real Muslim. And you'd have to say that they're getting something wrong and therefore they have resistance against Muhammad and therefore they're not real Muslims. But again, if, you, if that's your standard for what a real Muslim is, I think that I, there are not going to be a lot of real Muslims in the world because almost any Muslim I can point to, I can start pointing to some because their sources are so uh, hopelessly inconsistent. I can always point to something in their sources that they're not following. And so, yeah, you could say anyone's not a Muslim. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a, here's a question. I don't know if you, I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, Renee says, uh, I wonder why Bart doesn't view them as Greco-Roman biographies. This shows oh, you how did. behind, this shows you how behind I am on the comments, right? This is like a thousand oh, years what, ago. No. But wait, I thought, I thought Herman did. He no, I don't think he's got a problem with the Gospels being Greco-Roman biographies. I don't think so either, but. Well, Mike's actually had how many debates with him? Three? Six. Six? Oh, yeah. my goodness. And, and we're friends. That's cool. um, the written one was awesome, too. I read the whole thing, mm -hmm. by the way. Oh, that, yeah. And that was, I enjoyed, I've enjoyed all the debates with him, but um, the written one at, uh, what's the name? Thebestschools.org? Yeah. Yep. Um, that's probably the most substantive one we've had because, you know, we, especially as Dave, I don't know, John, if you've debated before, have you? No. Okay, mm -hmm. so as David would know, you know, you, you say things during the debate, you don't have a lot of time to be thinking about it. You, you're saying things on the fly. Um, and later on, you might look back and say, well, I wish I'd said that a little bit differently, or I could have said it differently and made it stronger. I missed a couple of points here. But in that written debate, we had, I think, like two weeks between, two weeks or one week between each of our responses to really think about how we wanted to articulate it. So it wasn't on the fly. So it's a more substantive debate on the reliability of the Gospels. Are the Gospels historically reliable? It's more substantive than the one we did live. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad you liked it. No, yeah, it was awesome. I thought it was good too. Hey, but there is a racist comment here from Rachel. It says, what? one of these guys is not like the other. She's clearly referring to me because I'm black. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. I think she tuned in late with the yellow shirts. <laughs> yeah, it could be the gray shirt. 
Um, all right, here you go, uh, Mike. <clears throat> How do you respond to the arguments against the resurrection of Richard Carrier and Robert Price? Hey, that's Matt. What's up, man? I know Matt. Hey, Matt. You know what? Uh, the last time we did the thing with Tim, Matt uh, said that he'd been an atheist and he read my big book on the resurrection hmm. and he gave up his atheism and became a Christian because awesome. he said even though he wanted, he didn't want to become a Christian, he couldn't deny the evidence. And, and he said, so he, he just couldn't reject it. He became a Christian. He says, Christ has risen. So, hey, Matt, I'm, awesome. I'm glad you uh, said something here, uh, sent in a question. Um, and yeah, thanks for those comments. So, you know, it's been a while since Richard Carey and I debated. I don't remember all of his objections. I think the last time we debated was uh, 2009 or 2010. We've had two debates. Uh, they've been enjoyable. I enjoyed both of them. Um, I don't actually remember all of his arguments, and I'm not sure of the arguments of Bob Price, to be honest with you. But, you know, the, these guys don't even think Jesus existed. And if they're not convinced by the evidence that, even by the evidence that Jesus existed, we shouldn't be surprised that they're not convinced by the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, I like both Richard. I like Bob. I find Bob to be fun to be with. You like Richard? No, I, I agree with Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob Sears, I've only met him once, but uh, he seemed like a fun guy. But polyamorous Richard Carrier? Come on, dude. Well, polyamorous I, Richard Carrier? Uh, you know, I, I, I debated him a couple of times. I, 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 I don't agree with the lifestyle he has, <clears> but <throat> uh, I've got no beef against him. So, but yeah, I, I'm not, I, I just, if you can type out a comment on what Richard and and um, Bob, well, yeah, I, I how they argue for the resurrection. Be happy to address it. I just don't. Remember. I haven't followed. I haven't followed Richard's stuff since you know a long time ago when uh, when he was saying that he's a uh, what he's greater than Aristotle. Or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know those responses that you gave about monkeys flying out his butt and yeah, all he, this stuff. So yeah, R that Richard, was Richard, let me give you some. Uh, uh, yeah, he's wild. Richard. Uh, Richard Carrier had his had his uh, his argument that uh, I call it the argument from large breasts. Right? Mm -hmm. I would I was reading this stuff in his book and I was like, "Are you serious?" Right? He gave his argument from large breasts, which is obvious, um, obviously, obviously God exists, right? Is that what he's no, 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 no. He said uh, he said uh, uh, large breasts can cause uh, back pain for women, and therefore a good God would not create women with large breasts, um, and therefore God doesn't exist. He actually argued <laughs> for the non-existence of God. Based on some women having large breasts, um, I kind of, I kind of think of all of Richard's arguments like that, right? When you see him making these kinds of arguments over and over again, then uh, it, this kind of goes back to the, you know, the ninety-nine-one rule and stuff. If you've got a guy and he has a, you know, he has a, uh, his 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 PhD was in Greco-Roman science, you know, the history of Greco-Roman science or something like that, and he's saying a bunch of stuff and he's saying, ah, you know, right here with the creed, uh, you know, this is just talking about a spiritual resurrection and they believed in a spiritual Jesus, not a physical Jesus. And this, you know, this came about later and it totally flies in the face of everything that modern scholars agree on. And you see the, the, the guy giving his argument from butt monkeys. You can, you can look that up. Um, the, the, he said the, he says that, he says the fact that there are no monkeys no blue monkeys flying out of my butt. Flying out of my butt proves that there are no blue monkeys. And I was like, No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Right? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. When the guy who's making arguments from large breasts uh, is is giving the same stupid arguments, you know, same kinds of stupid arguments against the resurrection and so on, I just I can't take him seriously. Um, so that that's 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 my view. But yeah, I would say you know look at the historical evidence for the for the resurrection and mm. see if carriers uh, or prices arguments actually account for the evidence they don't they're they're both clearly trying to trying to avoid something and yeah, well, not doing a good I, job i will say that there are a couple of um i think uh footnotes in my book where i, I address some of carriers arguments especially i think with the uh, the nature of jesus's resurrection body and how <laughs> richard interprets first corinthians 15 I, I think it's highly problematic so if i remember right i do deal with that uh, there with Paul's passage of First Corinthians wow. fifteen, forty two through forty five. That's probably his is. best argument, probably I would think. Oh, but it's not, not very that good. good. I know it's not that good. Yeah. I think it's his best one, probably. 
That's what I, I really like your. You think you too. you think it's better than his argument from uh, from large breasts? No, well, actually, maybe the monkey butt one, blue monkey butt. Blue monkeys flying out of his butt. No <laughs> blue monkeys flying out of his butt proves there are no blue monkeys. Yo, our boy uh, Vocab Malone's in the house. Cap, what? What it do? Yo, he said uh, Vocab actually debated Richard Carrier, which was a good debate. So you guys can go watch. <laughs> he it. said we're matching besties now. Yeah. <laughs> There's no cam. We should have had Lacona in the middle, huh? Yeah, we should have. Then we'd be like a mutant Weird. Oreo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Finding Truth says, uh, according to Matt Dillahunty, the narrative of the resurrection is nothing more than just claims, not evidence. How would you guys respond? Claims are not evidence. Now, guys, uh, I am debating Dillahunty. I do not know anything he said on this topic. Uh, so This came up uh, in his debate with Mike Winger. He's okay, saying, he's like, so he's saying claims are not evidence? Yeah, he basically says, all you have in the are in these documents, these historical documents, is a bunch of claims. These claims are not evidence. Well, claim, I mean, obviously <laughs> claims can be evidence. Right. If a bunch yeah. of people, I mean, what, what do we know from history that are that's not claims, exactly. right? And I science, mean, right? Yeah. It's when you have claims that you're using it within a hypothesis or a theory, yeah. that that can become evidence that that hypothesis theory is true. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you, you and have he, claims that yeah. that you have claims that um, Brutus and the other conspirators assassinated Caesar. Those are the claims. Yeah, yeah. You know, but it becomes evidence when you put together a hypothesis. Yeah. Now notice it, it would, you know, hey, this guy robbed me. If you were in court, you say this guy robbed me. He put a gun. He put a gun to me, and uh, and robbed me. That's a claim. Yeah. That, that, that's a claim. And so depend, depending on, you know, depending on other things, that might be enough or it might not be enough. If you have five people yeah. and they all seem trustworthy and they're all say, hey, this dude, this dude robbed this guy. And then you're putting together a case mm -hmm. yep. against this guy. Then those five claims become evidence. Yep. That's what happens. And then because um, I don't even understand De La Hunty's distinction either. He didn't clarify it well. But um, mm -hmm. but still, you put all these. Um, yeah. Anyways, I, I'm just saying the same thing would apply to this, you know, to the. To science in a way too all these scientists it's not as though the data is just like you know writing books and stuff people are making claims about the data so if you say oh claims are not evidence then you can't even trust science at that point so he makes a number of, of mistakes in these kinds of things like he goes against the minimal facts approach and he says the minimal facts approach that gary came up with gary habermas that it, it it's weak because these are cherry-picked well, no, they're not. Yeah. These are the facts that are regarded as virtually certain by a consensus of scholars, a heterogeneous consensus. So you're looking at skeptics and Christians and people of all different kind of faiths yeah. and worldviews. So they're not cherry picked. And then he says, um, you know, most would go with you include all the different facts. Why are you just doing a minimal fact? Well, because not everybody acknowledges these other things as facts. So what you do is you look for some least common denominators and say, what is it that qualified scholars on the subject can all agree on? What are these things? Yeah. Let's deal with these. Let's start by dealing with these. And let's formulate hypotheses that try to account for these. All right. And the, the ones that, if a hypothesis can't even account for these facts, then that hypothesis needs to come back to the drawing board or be abandoned altogether. Oh, yeah. um, if it can't even ac uh, account for the things that we are virtually certain are true. Yeah. Um, now, if you've got a couple of hypotheses that can both say they can account for these facts, well, now you go to some other yes. facts yeah. that maybe not are agreed upon by all. Yeah, and Dilla Hunty's the king of not providing an alternative <coughs> hypothesis. Yeah. And, and well, provide an alternative hypothesis, because then you compare them, and then you can see the deficiency in the alternate hypotheses, so he won't provide one. Um, yeah, and uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't really want to comment on, on the methodology here, because, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to look closer at, at what he said. But um, yeah, if he's just saying that claims aren't evidence, notice, uh, that, would, that would fly in the face of all history, that would fly in the face of all... Uh, just our daily living. <laughs> and someone, his claim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and his claim. His, so he made the claim. So he made the claim that claims are not evidence. Um, and so, but th this is, this is a problem. This is a problem in atheism that the method, the method is invented as they go along to avoid conclusions that they don't want. Right. So I was watching a debate between, I, I should put these clips together. 
I was watching a debate between uh, Richard Dawkins and John Lennox. This is years ago, so I'm hoping I hope I'm getting these right. Right. Um, and Richard Dawkins argues he's argue, he's responding to the argument. Um, he's responding to the cosmological argument. Right. And when he responds to the cos, check this out. He's responding to the cosmological argument by saying, look, you can't if, if, as you go back in time, the universe gets simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler. You can't go back to something way more complicated like God to explain what starts off very simple, right? You go back to something simple and you don't go to something vastly more complicated. So that's how he refuted the cosmological argument. As you go back in time, the universe gets simpler and simpler and simpler until it's just a little sing singularity. And you don't want to bring, you know, something as, as complex as God in there. So that's his response. Then when he's responding to the argument from fine tuning, the fine tuning of the cosmos. Why are the constants of physics and, and so on so perfectly calibrated to allow human life? He says, well, you know, if you go back, then we have the multiverse. And so there's this this vast array of alternative <laughs> universes that are, you know, this vast uh, machine cranking out all these other universes. And we're just the lucky one. But notice what he just did. <laughs> notice what he just did. Right. He got back to the beginning of our universe, the singularity, and then to explain some feature of ours, he goes back to a to a, an infinite array of alternative universes, which guess what? By definition, is infinitely more complex than ours. So he, it's notice it's what what method can I adopt to respond to this argument? And I do not care if I'm contradicting myself. I just don't care, right? So if I'm avoiding this argument, then what can I use to avoid this argument? Then I'm going to say, well, you can't go back to something more complex to explain something simple. And then I'm responding to this argument. What's my rule? Well, I got no problem going back to something vastly more, more complex. It's always adopt a method, even if it's completely ridiculous, if it helps you avoid the conclusion that, that, that theists are offering. So, hey, uh, Billy says, don't cough in the Kona's face. Yeah, no kidding. You guys, guys are dead. You guys, oh, you guys are already dead. I could cough in your face all, all we want right now. Because... <laughs> we're going to give the Kona coronavirus, and then we're going to be down a great mind thanks to this. If I get it, everyone's getting it. That's all I'm saying. If I get it, everyone's getting it. <laughs> So, <laughs> see how he rolls. <laughs> say that's that prison mindset, son. Prison oh wait, let mindset. me let me let me post this link here. So this is a uh, someone someone uh, someone pointed out that Cameron just posted posted a video on this. And no, I, did. I, I didn't. Yeah. I haven't watched that yet, but I did see the other day that he had posted something on the Dillahunty thing that claims are not evidence. Right. Yeah, I, I I didn't watch it because we're, we're yeah that. we're running around recording and stuff like that, so yeah. we haven't watched any new videos that are coming out on any channels. But uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and post it right here. Anyone wants to check that out? Um, I just posted a link right there. All right. Uh, 305 Thief says, tell Mike, th tell Mike to give us a discount on his book. It's funny that he's 305 Thief and he's asking for a discount on his book. <laughs> Why don't you just steal it? Go to a Christian bookstore and steal it. <laughs> you thief. <laughs> Where is this? Actually, I have, no, I have no say over that. I mean, the publishers, uh, I mean, I can't give discounts. I, I sell books at a, at a uh, if I'm speaking at a conference. You know, and I usually sell them for less than you can get them on Amazon. Um, but I don't just sell them otherwise. You just get them through Amazon or ChristianBook.com or Barnes & Noble or Aid Books. Um, got a question from Jacob H. here. Oh, let me get rid of this um, other question. Um, got a question from Jacob H. He says, hey, David, big fan. Question from Mike about minimal facts argument. Doesn't Galatians 1 and 2 tell us Paul's gospel was one of grace? Not from man. Thank you. Um, Galatians 1, one of grace, not from man. Yeah, do you understand not what he means here? No, I think what he's saying is, you know, when Paul talks about where he got... It's a revelation oh, yeah, from yeah. God, yeah, exactly. not from man. Jesus, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, from God, you're right. In, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sometimes skeptics will bring this up and they'll say, okay, well, it, Paul says he didn't receive it from man. He got it from a revelation from God. But yet when you come to... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I delivered to you what I also received. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's talking, I, I want to remind you of the gospel message that I preached to you. And then he says, I delivered to you what I also received. And he gives the oral tradition. Um, well, I think he's just saying here in, in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel message. I, 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 I'm, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. Now, I delivered to you what I also received. And then he gives the oral tradition. So he delivered to them the oral tradition, which is a, pretty much an outline of what the gospel message is, the death, burial, resurrection, and appearances of, of Jesus. But that doesn't mean, that, that's different from 
the gospel that he received as a revelation from God, let, let's say on the road to Damascus when, when Jesus appeared to him, that is what Paul is referring to there, I believe. He's not talking about the, the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. that well, this, yeah, and, and, and I, I, would have, I, would have, I would have to say he's pointing out Galatians 1 and 2, and those are, those are paradigm chapters of Paul going up to confirm his revelations by going to the original disciples, yep. right? Yep. No, well, no, Galatians was written before um, the, um, in Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Uh, that's what scholars believe it probably was, because he would have used the Jerusalem Council. Galatians 2? Yeah, Galatians. Well, there's a split on that, you know. Yeah. A lot of them I've think that's both. the same yeah. one. It's, it's yeah. tough. Yeah, that is that's tough. a tough one. Uh, but this one seems to be talking about the minimum, fa fa uh, minimum facts argument. So I'm assuming he's talking something about what, I'm trying to think what minimal fact has to do with the gospel of grace. I, I can't. I, that's what I was thinking. I don't know what. Yeah, the minimal facts argument would be yeah. we're, we're going to use facts that are so strongly evidence. They are supported by the data that uh, a near consensus or an overwhelming majority of critical scholars who study the subject grant them. Um, and then you build a case based on those minimal facts. The way Gary Habermas used to do it is like, hey, I'm just going to use your own facts. Yeah. I can give you a case with that. You yeah. Know? So um, that's the way it started off with Gary. Yeah. Hey. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think. Yeah. I, I kind of think the point is, um, Paul's Paul believes he got the gospel message through revelation, and yet in the min the minimal facts approach focuses a lot oh, on First Corinthians fifteen, the creed there, and. So, yeah, I, well, that, that just shows, you know, the tension that some skeptics bring up about he received it from Revelation yeah. or I delivered to you what I also received. I don't see any tension. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I don't yeah and, and and right here in Galatians, he he. So Paul received revelations, but Paul's also a guy who believes that Satan can appear as an angel of light. And so he realizes he's gotten revelations, but he goes up to the apostles and wants to make sure that he wasn't, uh, as he said, I wasn't running in vain. Yeah. That seems um, so he, he so was, he was, he was willing to go up and say, Hey, I've got my revelations that I received. I'm going to go up to the apostles and make sure. And think about that. Why, why wouldn't you, right? If you receive some sort of revelation and you can actually test and verify that to make sure it comes from God by taking a trip and going in and asking some questions about people who are actually there. Um, why wouldn't you do that? But Paul actually does that, and he says, "What they, they extended the right hand of fellowship to him." So they're they're acknowledging, "Yep, what what you what you received, that's 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 exactly correct." But yeah, the but 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 the creed there, yeah, the creed he received that from others. So Paul, there's no, yeah, there's 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 no, there's no conflict here. Paul received revelations, no question, but he also received traditions that he passed down from from others. So yeah. it's the form of the content <clears throat> that he delivered to them. And what he had received from others, mm -hmm. the yeah. format of the content. Hey, this guy says uh, a room of three mature men that still need to reinforce their man-made religious beliefs. Yeah, <laughs> what do you guys? Three say? mature men that still need to reinforce their man-made religious beliefs. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is kind of like the Muslim comment. Look, look, look at this. Uh, look, a man in the comments section who still needs to <laughs> reaffirm his atheism or whatever it is by trolling the computer. by trolling the comments section using a man-made computer. Yeah. <laughs> Great guys, you, you really refuted us. Great, thank you for adding that brilliant content. You, uh, you were stumped on that one. You're smashing it, dude. You're smashing it. <laughs> yeah, All right. Uh, uh, well, okay. I was just gonna say, Robert uh, Chopra says, Michael Tone. I'm a big fan. Just so you know, you got a fan out there. So you're the one. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we have Hindu historian. <clears throat> Hindu historian says, I think it's unfair. And so, as you might notice, Hindu historian is a Hindu. Hindu historian, uh, also regular, uh, regular on the channel uh, here a lot, uh, has discussions, very reasonable, uh, actually was encouraging me and William Lane Craig to uh, check out Hinduism and start responding to, you know, the positions of, of, of Hinduism. Um, <clears throat> but let's check this out here. Hindu historian says, I think it's unfair the disciples actually saw the risen Jesus, whereas every other Christian since has had to believe he rose despite it being such an extraordinary thing. Uh, and then he adds, by the way, no slow mode for me. So, yes, uh, I guess that is correct that <clears throat> Boom Squad members do not have slow mode. Yeah, that's dope. That is dope. That's weird. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it's interesting. <clears throat> the When you look at the word makarios, the Greek word makarios, which is the word for blessed, um, we, we see it in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, the, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those 
uh, the merciful, for they will receive mercy. W w sometimes we interpret that and say, blessed, what does that mean? Well, God will bless the poor in spirit. God will bless the pure in heart, the merciful, etc. But the word doesn't actually mean that. It means joyful, happy, carefree. And in more recent years, New Testament scholars have recognized another a prominent, in many cases, definition or meaning behind makarios, and that is flourishing, to flourish. And so he said, hey, you can flourish spiritually when you're poor in spirit. The merciful will flourish in their spiritual walk. The, those who are pure in heart will flourish in, in their, their walk with God. Now, keeping that in mind, you go to John chapter 20, right? And Jesus appears to Thomas, who had been doubting, who wanted to touch him, see him, touch him. And so you, you've got Jesus, he comes in and he allows Thomas to touch him, invites him to touch him. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And the next verse, Jesus says, Thomas, you have seen and believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Well, the word for blessed there is makarios again. And what Jesus is saying, Thomas, you've seen and believed, but you can, those who will come to believe, they may not see me as you guys have, but they can still flourish in their Christian walk. And I know all three of us here, none of us have seen Jesus personally, but we look at the evidence, we have a relationship with God, and we can flourish in our Christian life. Would I like to see Jesus? Absolutely. Um, but you know what? There, you talk, Paul talks about having a thorn in the flesh because he had these great heavenly revelations, right? And God gave him a thorn in the flesh in order to keep him humble. Well, I, I'll tell you what, um, you know, sometimes I think about God, I, yeah, I'd like to have some, something even more like an appearance of Jesus, but if that comes with a thorn in the flesh, you know what, I think I might have enough evidence as it is now. Um, <laughs> So I think he has given us sufficient evidence. Mm -hmm. I would have liked more. Yeah, I'd like more. Um, would it be sufficient? Uh, would it increase my faith? Yeah, perhaps. But, you know, I, I could always go back to, to having some sort of doubt. Well, how do I know that that was really yeah. Jesus rather than Satan <laughs> appearing, you know, deceiving me on it? You could always have those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> To fail, Ahmed here has just been uh, uh, trolling with uh, by. He's not just so everyone knows. He's not. Uh, he's not actually thinking of any of this himself. He's he's just uh, copying parts of a list that supposedly clear, uh, uh, compare Christianity and Islam. So that's uh, that's trolling. So go ahead and block. Uh, I see he's already been timed out, but go ahead and block him, um, guys. If you want. We sit here and interact with Muslims, we sit here and interact with atheists, we interact with Christians, but if you're just going to come and pull up a website and be posting a bunch of uh, ridiculous nonsense, then... That's um, lazy, bro. Yeah, we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. But as a, as a nice parting gesture, we'll go ahead and, and pick one of your comments here. So check this out. And, and this, this, because really, I mean, you know, to fail, uh, you know, we don't want to... The, the, the problem is, if, we th if I thought to fail was being genuine and had a genuine objection, I'd be happy to discuss it. When you're just, you know, again, pulling up a, a, website, a list on a website and, and posting things, and that's all you're doing, and every 60 seconds you're, post you're, you're, you're cutting and pasting something, you're not, you're not, really, you're not really having a, a discussion. Uh, but as a nice parting gesture, to fail said, uh, why, are you not in, <laughs> why are you not in your original language? The Bible answers, because people have made a lot of changes in me. Quran, I'm in my original language, Arabic, and not corrupted. Now think about how stupid this is. <laughs> On how many levels this is stupid. Uh, Mike, we have the Bible in its original languages, right? Yep. We do. Okay. So we have the Bible in its original languages. We also have the Bible in translation. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Do we have the Quran in its original language? Yep. Yeah. We, 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 no, we got it. <laughs> and we have the Quran in translation. So think about how dumb this is. No, we don't have the original language Bible. Well, this shows you haven't done 60 seconds of actual research, if you don't know, <laughs> that we have the Old Testament and the original Hebrew and Aramaic and the New Testament in the original Greek. Those are the, the original languages of Scripture. What, what else do we have? We have translations to allow people to read in other languages. You've got the exact same thing with the Quran. But notice, so notice, you're completely wrong about not having the Bible in its original language. But then you say... Because you don't have the, the, the Bible in its original language, the, re, the reason for that is because there are all these changes to it. 
I was thinking that he I'm was. thinking that's incredibly stupid. <laughs> what? Your entire argument is based on the idea that we don't have the Bible in its original languages. And yeah. the reason we don't is because there are all these changes. One, two, two, he's assuming that the, the... How would you know there were changes? <laughs> yeah, I know. You just, that's why I say you can tell he's just copying stuff. And then he says, uh, we, we have, since we have the Quran in its original language, it's Arabic and not corrupted. What planet are you from? Read your own <laughs> sources. You haven't studied the Bible. You haven't studied the history of the Quran. Your Muslim sources talk about two entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing. Two entire chapters. That's Conspiracy, according to Abu bro. Musa. That's according to Abu Musa and Sahih Muslim. He talks about... Uh, Muslims hardening their hearts, not not reciting these two chapters enough, and they they forgot them. And he uses this to encourage other Muslims not to harden their hearts and stop reciting the Quran. We don't want to lose more of it. Um, large passages of the Quran were lost when the people who had them memorized died in battle. Individual verses were lost because they were eaten by Aisha's sheep. This is what you find if you actually go to your sources. Why don't you do this? Why do you spout complete nonsense? Why do you do this? Why do you go to a website and, and say, I'm going to post this without bothering to do 60 seconds of research. They don't want the truth, dog. They don't, they don't want, want the, the truth. truth. They can't they handle the truth. truth. <laughs> yeah, that was dope. You know, if he didn't know about the goat eating it, that's just bad research. <laughs> Mike, that was a bad <laughs> <laughs> All right, so bye to fail. <laughs> that, was, that was our parting gift to you. A um, couple of uh, super chats and super stickers here. Um, uh, where's my church sock says God the Father in heaven and our Holy Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless and protect you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And please uh, yeah, pray for us. We have uh, we're trying to get a lot done here. Now, holistic Python. I happen to know that my friend Sam Shimon, even though he has the worst live streams in all of history and uh, is the worst troll ever and is known worldwide as shameless Shamoon, uh, happens to be. Uh, <laughs> happens to be an expert on this. So come back when I'm going live with Shamoon and we will, we will actually go live and we can do this. But anyway, let's read the comment here. Holistic Python says, Archangel Michael is Jesus Christ. Zechariah uh, 3.2, Jesus says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Jude 1.9, Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. Jesus saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Michael cast Satan to earth from heaven. And we will clear, gladly do. This is a doctrine in, from Jehovah Witness. Doctrine. Yeah. That's right. Jehovah's go ahead. Witness. Yeah. So uh, just because you did that, we're going to go ahead and have an entire live stream on Jehovah's Witnesses and their arguments, and we will cover yeah. that up. So, so stay tuned. That's good. If you want to talk, now keep in mind, we, we were not bothering you. We were not messing with you. We were not picking on you. We were completely ignoring you. You wanted us to talk about this. So <laughs> don't come complaining when we do a live stream and we're exposing Jehovah's Witness arguments and theology and say, why are you going after us? Why aren't you just focused on there? You, it always amazes me that like, like atheists are like this, right? <laughs> like I'm completely content responding to the objections of Muslims and so on, but there, I have tons of atheist fans who, who you know, they, they don't, they don't, they don't mess with me at all. They, 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 they like it when I'm wrecking Islam. But others just come into mock, not realizing, okay, look, if you eventually are running your mouth enough, eventually I'm going to respond to you and so on. So, guys, if you bring up something and then I eventually go after that position, do not come crying to me later. So, anyway. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a cool. I was actually thinking about getting Sam on for that topic too. But now that you're going to do it, I'm going to have to think of something else. And John Nepper in the super sticker. That is. <laughs> hey, it's yellow. Look at it's the super us. sticker. That is. We have the yellow <laughs> shirt. And then there's a little green one. I guess that's Mike, but you're yep. gray. <laughs> um, what are we at? We're at nine thirty. We should probably we should probably be uh, we should probably be um, wrapping up now because. We got to get up at what time? We have to, to DW. Well, I'm not getting up because I'm just going to stay up. We have to leave for the airport at 2 a.m. So John will probably fall asleep and get a couple hours sleep. I'm just going to say heck with it and stay up until until I leave. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Probably do one or two more comments while we do. Jay Shy says, Mike, what do you think about atheists claiming the authors are not the apostles? Also, the claim Paul is the only guy is the only one who gave his own testimony. Only only one who gave his own testimony. Well, the authorship of the Gospels, I think, is a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, some would say, well, uh, the authors are, are not the apostles. Well, we could certainly say that of Mark and Luke, right? But the early testimony we have is that Mark, his primary source was that of Peter, and that comes from a guy named Papias, who is writing somewhere between the first decade of the second century and, and the middle of the second century, somewhere between the years 100 and 150. Um, the average date that he's is placed at is about 130. 
I'd place him probably earlier than that. Uh, I think the first decade of the second century is, is probably correct. But let's just put it at 130, okay? Um, Papia says he received this information from an associate of one of Jesus' apostles and that he received this information while that apostle was still alive and teaching, which means that Papias would have received this information sometime in the latter part of the first century. So he receives it from someone who knew um, the apostle John and received it while John was still teaching. That's pretty amazing. So, and so Mark is reporting what he heard Peter say. That's his primary testimony. Luke says he, he got his information. He's a little vague here or ambiguous, I should say, it's hard to determine whether he's saying he got his information from the eyewitnesses or those who received their information from the eyewitnesses, or perhaps he even means both. Um, certainly got his information from Peter, uh, I'm sorry, from Mark. He's using Mark as a primary source. So that would have been one of the sources. He got it from someone who received it from the eyewitnesses. And, and a lot of people would think that he's also receiving it from eyewitnesses. So um, that's pretty good. The majority of scholars today, Johannine specialists, uh, they do not think that John, the son of Zebedee, was the author of John's gospel. Now, some of us, like myself, Craig Keener, Craig Blomberg, and some others, we do think it was John, the son of Zebedee, but we are a, a very small minority of New Testament scholars thinking that. Nevertheless, the majority of Johannine specialists, New Testament scholars who specialize in the gospel of John, would say that the author of John's gospel, his primary source, was one of Jesus' apostles, perhaps a minor disciple who had traveled with Jesus. Still, it's still based on eyewitness testimony. Matthew is probably the hardest, the most difficult of them all. Um, it's a little hard to unpack, or it would take some time to unpack. Personally, I think that Matthew uh, was was very closely involved in the penning of that gospel that has been attributed to him. Um, that he supervised, that he provided a lot of information. Um, and probably there was a scribe who was uh, under Matthew's direction and used some other things like Mark's gospel and some other material. So um, whereas Mark and Luke, you know, weren't apostles, they're certainly getting their information from credible sources. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, this person <clears throat> says, uh, my brother David, definitely hardcore pulling an all-nighter. So for the record... Me and Mike were working while David was sleeping like a baby. Slowly yeah, I, I came back and clap. I came back and collapsed. So I did take a nap earlier. So I am yeah. staying up all night, um, heading to the airport. That's right. Uh, but then I will get home and, and sleep tomorrow, mm -hmm. and then get back to crushing it in videos. <laughs> um, dear Dad said, "Wish he talked like this in the debate with Muhammad Hijab." So he's saying, "Hey, this is you know because I'm saying, hey, this is stupid. This is ridiculous." Uh, dear Dad, uh, if you follow the the aftermath of that. Um, the Muslim organizers insisted that we agree to be respectful and not to insult, um, not to go off topic, not to bring up certain things that weren't part of the topic. Uh, as a Christian, if I make that agreement, I have to stick to it. Unfortunately, there are Muslims who don't believe they have to honor the, their agreements with non-Muslims or at least with non-Muslims who, who, you know, who criticize Muhammad. And so I don't know if you're saying you wish I would have violated the agreement, but I'm not going to. What I will do is if you violated an agreement in a debate, I'm taking it out on your profit later. I'm taking it out on your profit later. And by the way, you can you can <laughs> you can thank Muhammad Hijab for the Muhammad's boom boom rope, right? That's why that's why we started that, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> you guys keep breaking because he wasn't he wasn't the first. He was part of a long series of guys who would insist on all these rules. I would stick to the rules to the letter, and my opponent would go down the list and violate every last one of them on purpose to throw it in my face that, hey, we don't have to, we don't have to keep our, our, our agreements with you. Um, so, yeah, and, and it's always, you can get away with that in the debate, but again, I'm taking it out on your profit later, so don't come crying to me. Hey, uh, real quick, this one says, uh, from Open View Mountain says, David, why do atheists hate philosophy? Now, what's funny about this is I will actually be working on a series, because atheists don't just hate philosophy. Um, a lot of the ones that I talked to. What are you? awesome atheist philosophers. What are you talking no, about? No, there are. There okay. are. No, no. I'm saying like I, when I say. Oh, this, the new the new atheists are very yes, anti philosophy. Yes, so they yep, complain. The new yep, atheists. Yep. A lot of the online guys, for the most part, this isn't even close to how it is in academia. Like yeah. academic atheists and stuff like this. But a lot of the online online guys, not all of them, but they tend to not just hate philosophy. They hate the laws of logic. They hate history. They hate science. They hate a whole lot of stuff. So I'll be working on a series on that soon. So uh, you guys can check that out. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've got you, you've got brilliant atheist philosophers and so on, but, yeah. but they're right. The, the, the new atheists, the new atheists they, they have really have really declared war on philosophy by, by claiming right. that, you know, whereas whereas right. science, right. science advances very rapidly and it's, and, you know, it's got all these things you can confirm and philosophy is just not like that. You're, you're trying to figure all these things out in your head without actually going and seeing how they correspond to reality. So we've got to be done with philosophy and get to, you know, focus more on on science and uh yeah it's a but notice if you're if you're talking that's about throwing out philosophy that's logic that's metaphysics no, that's, that's epistemology using philosophy that's ethics and so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um oh gosh i can't resist man okay here's a here's a here's a comment uh by two file from earlier yo I, i'd already pointed out i'd already pointed out that um i'd already pointed out that Wow. You can sit here making these claims and not realizing how ignorant your claim is. Uh, Tufail says, there is a big difference between the Torah of the Quran and the Torah of the Bible. <laughs> Tell them how you really feel, d -dub. Tell okay. them how you feel. Let's go through this. Tufail. According to Surah 3, verses 3 to 4 of your Quran. According to Surah 3, verses 3 to 4 of your Quran, Allah inspired the Torah and the Injil, the Torah and the Gospel. He gave them, right? According to Surah 7, verse 157 of your Quran, Christians and Jews were still reading the Torah and the Gospel during the time of Muhammad. So they're still reading them. So we know that according to your Quran, they were still preserved. They were still preserved and still in the possession of Jews and Christians during the seventh century guess what we have copies of the torah and the gospel before the seventh before the seventh century so we know what they're talking about right if you're saying that the torah has been corrupted oopsie the quran says that no one can change allah's words sir 18 verse 27 sir 6 verse 115 no one can change allah's words and i'll remind you sir 3 verses 3 to 4 declare that the torah and the gospel are allah's words if you go to sir 5 Verse 43, we already mentioned Surah 5, verse 47, which commands Christians to judge by the gospel, which makes no sense if the Christians don't have the gospel anymore because they've corrupted it. But if we go back to a few verses earlier, Surah 5, verse 43, interesting situation. Some Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute they were having, and Allah responds to Jews coming to Muhammad by saying, why do they come to you when they have the Torah? Notice, you're saying that the Torah is different from the Torah that the, the Quran refers to. The Quran says that the Jews have the Torah in the seventh century. We know what the Torah was in the seventh century. We have copies before that. So your God says, Muhammad, they do not need you. They've got the Torah. We know what the Torah was in the seventh century. You're saying they're different. So you're saying what? You're saying Allah is ignorant. And you know that they're not the same thing. Allah says they're the same thing. So you're telling us that Allah is ignorant. And we shouldn't trust what he says because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Gets worse, though. Muhammad, during the same situation, we know from the Hadith, we know the historical background. When the Jews came to Muhammad to judge this dispute, he gets this revelation and he tells them, bring me the Torah. And Muhammad sits on this judgment cushion. The judge would sit on this special cushion in Arabia. So he sits on the judgment cushion. He tells the Jews, bring me the Torah. When they bring him the Torah, Muhammad takes the cushion out from under him, puts the Torah on it and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So according to your prophet and your God, the Torah that is in the possession of Jews to this day, because they have the same Torah that they had in the seventh century and that they had well before this, centuries before then, your God and your prophet say that Torah, the Torah that is in the possession of the Jews is the same Torah that was revealed to them and that they have to judge by that, and they do not need Muhammad because they still have the original Torah. You just called Allah the biggest liar in history, and you called your prophet the biggest liar in history. So mm -mm -mm. there goes your religion, Tufail. Mm -mm. You're no longer, notice, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran says that if you have the slightest resistance to anything Muhammad has claimed, tell him, tell you're him. not a real Muslim. Preach. You're not a real Muslim. <laughs> not uh... according to me, but according to the great God Allah. If you have any resistance, to anything, anything Muhammad has said, well, you are not a real Muslim. Muhammad said, I affirm that Quran. And you said, no, I do not affirm that Quran. And this means what? Like a hill, like a hill. It means your, your religion is a false religion, according to you. And you are not a real Muslim, according to you. So you're going to need forgiveness. Sorry, but you're not going to find it in your religion. 
So I encourage you to actually uh, do, do, do some study beyond uh, cutting and pasting stuff off some horrible website and actually do some reading here. Hey, All right. um, real quick though, Nona Bubble had a comment that you might want to comment on. Who, who, who? Uh, Nona Bubble. Um, this comment's really going to pop. Says, uh, <laughs> that one's bad. John never did this until he's hanging out with Mike. So he's, Mike has completely corrupted and ruined John forever. <laughs> it says, um, Jesus only appeared to be dead. That's God's magic. Uh, smiley face. And Allah is all loving. He does love us. He knows better than us. All the guides. And then goes on to argue how um, God deceived or all of deceived everybody by making them think that Jesus was really on the cross. What are the implications of that view, David Wood? Um, well, Mike, you, Mike, you want to, you want to, you, 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 you debated Muslims as well. So, what are the implications of, of which, which, which view? The ones that the, the survival one or the non-survival one? Uh, no, the deceiver said, verse yeah. was revealed when Allah deceived the enemies by tr by deceiving by deceiving the enemies by tricking the, uh, by tricking that Jesus died, but He only made him look as if he died. Deceived has a positive and negative connotation. So just so everyone knows, Allah is the greatest of deceivers in the Quran. And uh, Allah tricked and deceived, according to, according to this, Allah tricked and deceived the enemies of Jesus into believing that he died on the cross. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? Well, one thing you pointed out to me a long time ago is that not only did... Does that require that Allah would have deceived the enemies, which we could understand that, but he also deceived the disciples of Jesus, whom you point out that the Quran refers to as Muslims. Okay, so again, you can understand why he would deceive the enemies, but why would you deceive the followers of Jesus and have them start and perpetrate the largest religion in the world and greatest competitor to Islam? That wouldn't seem to be very smart of a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember you pointing out that to me years ago. Something I've noticed, though, is I've studied things historically about Jesus, is we can determine, we can conclude that Jesus actually predicted his imminent death. So, I mean, there's a number of reasons I could give for you to believe that, uh, to think that Jesus predicted his death. So if Jesus did not die as he predicted, uh, well, that makes him a false prophet, and the Quran says he is a, a great prophet. So that would mean the Quran is mistaken because Jesus was a false prophet. But if Jesus died as he predicted, well, the Quran is still wrong because it says God only made it appear that Jesus died, but he really didn't. Um, so if Jesus actually died, then the Quran is false on that sense. Either way, the Quran is wrong. Mm -hmm. So you're caught between this proverbial rock and a hard place, and the only way out of it is to say, well, Jesus didn't actually teach that he would die an imminent death. But I could give you several reasons to think that he did, and you would have to overcome all of this. So we've got really good reasons to think that Jesus predicted his death. We've got no good reasons to think that he did not, or that he did not die, because all the historical evidence, even Shabir Ali, if you remember that first debate I had with him, you were there. Shabir Ali acknowledged that all the evidence points to Jesus' death by crucifixion. It's not only the Christian sources, mm -hmm. it's in non-Christian sources. And so we have all these reasons to believe Jesus died by crucifixion. And the only thing that he to think that he didn't is a book that mentions this and claims that he didn't, that was written 600 years after Jesus, contradicts those who knew Jesus, contradicts the eyewitnesses, contradicts all the evidence we have. So you can believe what you want, but you're only using theological reasons. I'm going to use historical reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently, apparently, uh, I, I was wondering if, if someone was bringing it up uh, to get us to respond to it, or if someone is actually a Muslim. But Nona Bubble says uh, it's not a false religion, and I've already ha and I already have a Christian online friend who is trying to convince me to leave Islam and be a Christian. He actually suggested this channel and a few others. Uh, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to add to what Mike just said there. So he pointed out Jesus predicted his own death. So Jesus predicted that he was going to die. Um, I want to add, as we've already discussed, your Quran, you can read it, chapter 5, verse 47, a bunch of other passages, 7, 7, 157, uh, 568 says to Christians and Jews, we have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the Torah and the gospel. That makes no sense if our scriptures have been corrupted. So we know that the Quran is affirming the scriptures in the possession of Jews and Christians during the 7th century, and we know what those scriptures said. 
We know what those scriptures said. Yeah, so Jesus' death is a major theme throughout all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so your Quran affirms our book and tells us, commands us to judge by our book. We are commanded by your God in the Quran to judge by what we read in the gospel. And Allah specifically says that if we don't judge by what he revealed in the gospel, then we're no better than those who rebel. So we're rebels if we don't judge by the gospel. What does the gospel say? Jesus died by crucifixion over and over and over again, like a beating drum. So, uh, so one, you have, there's no way out of this, right? Jesus predicted his death if he didn't, Jesus predicted that he was going to be killed on the cross. If he didn't, then, if he didn't, then he's a false prophet. And so he can't be a true, he can't be a, a true Muslim. He's a false prophet. But if he did, then the Quran is wrong. So either way, your religion loses. Uh, second, we have the we have the Quran affirming our scriptures. Our scriptures say that Jesus died by crucifixion. So there are two possibilities here. Either we trust our scriptures and judge by them, or we don't. If we trust and judge by our scriptures, then Islam is false because, because our scriptures affirm that Jesus died by crucifixion. If we don't trust and judge by our scriptures, then Islam is false because Islam affirms our scriptures and tells us to judge by them. So either way, you lose again. Now, you, your, your, your way of getting around the theological objection, which, by the way, just think about this, right? People see Jesus crucified. It was a public event. It was a public crucifixion. The Muslim response is, no, no, no. Allah deceived people because he's the best of deceivers. He's the best of those who do it. Allah tricked and deceived people by disguising someone else to make him look like someone. And the most common thing that Muslims say today is Judas, right? So they'll say someone else was crucified in Jesus' place. And this is what Allah did. Now, your way of reconciling this with your belief in Allah is to say, ah, but he only tricked the enemies. That's, that's wrong, right? It's the disciples, right? It's the disciples, again. Mm -hmm. It's the disciples who came to believe. Jesus' original followers came to believe that he died on the cross. Where did they get that idea? Well, we happen to know, according to Islam, that Allah tricked and deceived people into believing that he died. He made it a public event, right? In other words, in other words, are you claiming, are you claiming, are you claiming that Jesus' enemies saw him being crucified, but no one else saw it? Is that your claim? It's a public crucifixion. It's a public event. But think about this. One, why would God deceive people about that? Why would he make them think they had victory when they didn't? So, so even if, so this is an even if, but in fact, even if Allah only deceived the enemies of Jesus, why would he do it? I can understand God, you know, tricking someone for something, right? Like if, if I'm about to walk out of here and there's a gang of people and they want to murder me and God tricks them into thinking I went one way when I went a different way, I don't have, I don't, I don't have any particular problem with that. But there I would understand why it's being done. What's the purpose of Allah making people think that Jesus died when he didn't, right? You can't say it's to protect Jesus. Jesus was taken safely to heaven. So what was the point? What was the point of it, right? So that's one problem. Even if you were, were right, um, that still, that still doesn't make any sense. But, but second, the but in fact part, everyone came to believe that Jesus died by crucifixion, right? Jesus' followers, uh, the, the Jews, the Romans, everyone believed that Jesus died by crucifixion. Why? Because it was a public event. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, as Mike pointed out, even, even Muslims will acknowledge, yes, all the evidence we have tells us that, tells us that Jesus died, but he didn't because we know Allah was just trick, tricking and deceiving everyone. So it was, keep in mind, it was Jesus' own followers who, according to the Quran, were devout Muslims. The Quran says that Jesus' followers were Muslims. We know historically that those followers went to their horrible, bloody deaths proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Why did they do that? Because they believed he'd risen from the dead. Why did they believe that? Because they, the, 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 the crucifixion was a public event. Everyone knew he was crucified. And then he's alive again later and appearing to them. So when Muslims want to say, you know, Christianity was corrupted by someone like the Apostle Paul, don't blame Paul. Blame Allah. Yeah. <laughs> Your God, Allah, is the one who corrupted Christianity, right? And, and just think about, think about how absurd this is. Allah gives Jesus all these miracles. You've got the virgin birth. Jesus is raising the dead, according to Islam. He's curing, he's cleansing lepers. He's the Messiah. He does all of these miracles. And then as soon as, as soon as Allah takes Jesus away, he convinces everyone that Jesus died on the cross for no reason. And then even Jesus' followers come to believe that he died on the cross for their sins. Why, did, why does your God ruin everything Jesus did, right? So that now, by, by the end, you had basically two categories of people. There were people who rejected Jesus, regarded him as a, as a false messiah. According to Islam, they're, they're going to hell for rejecting Jesus. 
And there were people who were bowing down and worshiping, as the, worshiping him as the risen Lord. Why did they believe he's the risen Lord? Because they believed he died and then rose from the dead. So what does Allah do? He completely destroys everything Jesus does, and then he has to clean up the mess You know, six centuries later when, when Muhammad comes along. Is, is, that, is, that, is that the God you believe in, a guy who just st starts false, co corrupts the work of his own prophet, Jesus? That's his prophet, right? He corrupts the message and teachings of his own prophet, leads even devout Muslims astray, because your, keep in mind, your... Your book says that Jesus' followers were devout Muslims. We know that they, again, they went to their bloody desks proclaiming that he's the risen Lord. Why? According to your religion, it's because Allah led them astray. And still is deceiving because he says to trust the, the, the NGO, right? Mm -hmm. And then backs it up by saying, hey, guys, if you're thinking, hey, we don't want to judge by that, you better judge by it or you're a rebel. You have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon those texts that affirm Jesus' death by crucifixion. So just over and over and over. And then you better believe in what Jesus said. You better believe in the gospel and you better believe in what Jesus said. Well, Jesus said he's going to die by crucifixion. This is, there, there's no way to reconcile this. So there are basically two possibilities here. Either we have the word of God or we don't have the word of God. If we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. Your religion massively self-destructs. That's just what happens when you affirm the texts and teachings of a religion that completely contradict your own religion. So time for a new religion. <laughs> Time for a new religion known a bubble. All right, we done here? Yeah, I think we're about done, ladies and gentlemen. It's been nice kicking it with everybody. It's uh, 615 people watching, 620 people watching. For you four people that just tuned in just now, <laughs> you're late. <laughs> you're late. You can go back and watch it, though. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's been good joining you guys. Being yeah. with you last night and tonight, this has been fun. Yeah, man. Yeah, always good. Make sure you guys check out Mike Lacona's book, uh, The Resurrection of Jesus. Also, um, your book, Are There Contradictions in the Gospels? Um, and check out my YouTube channel. Yep, and his YouTube channel. Just Mike Lacona, L-I-C-O-N-A. Mike, Mike Lacona. <clears throat> uh, Eddie, I got it. Thanks, man. I'll, t I'll take a look. Um, I can't help myself. <laughs> Where did it go? I saw a comment from Nona here. Oh, yeah, she said we should watch your video. No. <coughs> yeah, I was looking for that comment. I just yes, I watched you explain that in your other videos. The Quran says to rely on Bible ETC. I mean, to, I mean, to all a trick to save Jesus? Hang on, let's read this. Yes, I watched you explain that in your other videos. The Quran says to rely on Bible, etc. That's true. You're correct on that. I mean, to Allah tricked to save Jesus, but judging doesn't mean believing from others. So, so when the Quran, oh, okay. so when the Quran oh. orders us to judge by the gospel, it's not telling us to believe in that. Why, why would we judge by the gospel? Yeah, you know, what does that mean then? How yeah, I mean, obviously, if I'm, if I'm, if 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 the Quran says that we have to judge by the gospel, we we have to believe we have to believe that it's the word of God, which your book says. Your book says that it's the word of God. Your book affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah and the gospel. Surah 7, 157 said that Christians and Jews were still reading the gospel and the Torah during the time of Muhammad. We know what that gospel says. We know what that gospel says. And besides, you're going with the judging. Again, Surah 5, verse 68 of the Quran says that Jews and Christians have no ground to stand upon if we do not stand upon the revelation that has come to us, the Torah and the gospel. So if that's not telling us to believe in it, if Allah is saying that he revealed it and that no one can change his words and that Christians still had the Torah and the gospel during the time of Muhammad and commanding us to judge by it and saying that we have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon it, if that's not saying believe in it, I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Allah is clearly telling us that that is our revelation. And just so you know, um, no, no, and you can, you can come back if you want to talk about this more. We have to get off here. But... Um, uh, if you, if you want to really understand the position of the Quran with the other scriptures, uh, check out my video. Check out my video. I have a video titled something along the lines of... Um, trying to think. Why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. Hmm. So look up my video. Uh, so if you want to look up that real quick yep. and, 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 yep. and share that. But the video is titled, Why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. Muslims today, you can go to, you can go to your Muslim apologists. They will tell you what? They will say, ah, you know... Uh, Allah gave them the Torah, but they corrupted that. Allah gave them the gospel, but they corrupted that. 
So then Allah, you know, he decided, no more, I'm going to give them a new book, a Quran, and I'm going to protect it. That's what your Muslim apologists would tell you. That is absolute ridiculous nonsense, not according to me, according to your own book. If you read the Quran, and again, video is why the Quran is revealed in Arabic. The message of the Quran is that Allah sent prophets into all parts of the world. Allah sent prophets into all parts of the world. And these prophets revealed scriptures in different parts of the world. The Arabs were the last people to receive a revelation from God. And according to the Quran, if the Arabs were the only people who didn't receive a revelation from God, they would be able to stand before Allah on the judgment day and say, we didn't get a revelation in our own language. Everyone else got a revelation in their own language. We didn't get a revelation in our own language. So in order to stop that objection, Allah gives them the Quran in Arabic. And the message of the Quran from then on is everyone then has their book. Jews have their book in their language. Christians have their book in their language. And now the Arabs have the book in their language. That's the message of the Quran. So notice that is very, very different. And that's why the Quran is affirming all of these other scriptures. These are the other scriptures for other people in different languages. According to the Quran, people need a book in their own language. Otherwise, they have to rely on other people on other people to tell them what's in the book, or they have to spend, you know, spend a, a massive part of their life going out and learning other languages. The Quran says, no, 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 I can't expect the Arabs to go and learn Hebrew to understand the, the Torah. I can't expect them to learn Greek to understand the New Testament. I can't expect them to do that. People need a revelation in their own language. What do Muslims tell us today? We all have to read the Quran in Arabic, even though that's not our language. Completely, what Muslims say completely contradicts your own book. Why? Because the Quran is completely incoherent. It just can't make sense of any of this, right? The Quran affirms these other scriptures as the incorruptible word of God. But eventually Muslims went and looked at those texts and realized these completely contradict Islam. However, they couldn't draw the obvious conclusion. The obvious conclusion was mm -hmm. Muhammad and Allah didn't know what they were talking about. We can't trust them. False prophet, false God. We need a new religion. So what did by, they the say? by the time they recognized this, they would have gotten their heads chopped off for saying this. Mm -hmm. you, couldn't, you couldn't go on and say, hey, I think Muhammad's wrong. They would chop your head off. So they had to say, oh, uh, I guess those other scriptures have been corrupted. What about Allah saying that? We're just going to ignore that. We're just going to ignore that century after century after century and hoping people like Nona Bubble don't recognize it. Well, Nona Bubble, you're here. Now you have to recognize it. So check out that video and come back on a later live stream and we're, uh, we'll, we'll be happy yeah. to discuss this more. And I posted the video a couple of times. So I just posted it one more time. So you guys can go click on it and go watch that video right now because we're about a year. And uh, shout out to Cad for the super chat. Yep. And, uh, and Josu Neves. Uh, yeah, and I, I know there were other super chats where, where we're scrolling through the comments that, uh, that we didn't get to. Sorry about that. But uh, thanks for everyone for super chats and super stickers. And uh, people became channel members. Thanks to John and Mike for, for joining us while we're down here. Even though we're worn out and uh, got, got an early flight. Um, yep. The links to John's channel and Mike's channel are in the description box. So if you're interested in um, John, uh, tell them what you normally deal with again. For people came yep. to light. Yeah, so yeah, so I um, usually just respond to anti-Christian memes, videos, and breezy slogans, and also give cultural commentary um, and talk about how the gospel ties in with whatever's going on in culture. That's what I do. And so if you're interested in that sort of thing, got his channel. Mike, what do you cover on your channel again? Well, I've got a lot of my debates. I've had 33 public debates, and a lot of them, most of them, are on my YouTube channel. I've debated Muslims, I've debated uh, agnostics and atheists, um, and... Uh, I have a number of my lectures. I uh, deal with things such as the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, the historical reliability of the Gospels, why there are differences in the Gospels, all these kinds of, of things, and other topics as well. Who did Jesus think he was? Did he think he was God? Um, things like that. We have some other things on there. We've got a series that's coming out here pretty soon called A Fly on the Wall. So I hang around with some pretty cool people. Uh, at times we have some... Obviously. Really, absolutely, man. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And we have some great discussions. So um, I find people saying to me, boy, I wish I could be a fly on the wall when you, you're having these discussions. And uh, so you're going to be able to. Yeah. So, yeah and, and, and by the way, I mean, lots of people always say that. I would have, I would have loved to have heard the discussions between you guys and the BO and stuff back in the day. And so you're actually doing it, saying, hey, let's record stuff. And then we, get, we, we have those discussions. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Fresh. All right. All right, guys. We are officially out of time out of time. i'm gonna go pack yeah, see you too. all later uh i'll probably be going live with the apostate prophet in a couple days i haven't verified with him but uh we got some cool cool uh, cool announcement coming out tomorrow and uh so 
See you all then. Catch you later. All right, everyone.